What is up everyone? Welcome to part number seven of the Home Network series. I'm going to come out and say it straight away. This is going to be the final part of the series. In this video we're going to tie up all of the loose ends that we started in part five and six. As you guys know we didn't quite get to finish everything that I set out to do in the previous parts. So in this video we're going to tie up all of those loose ends quite literally, and we're also gonna do something else quite exciting. Starting today, we are going to reconfigure the entire rack in preparation for new equipment. So, it is quite sad that this series is ending, but it never should have taken four years anyway. This was only ever meant to be the initial setup of my network. And the really good news is, we're gonna be starting a new series, hopefully fairly soon, depending on a few different circumstances, but fairly soon, where I basically deploy a load of new equipment in my home network. So think of today and the final part of the networking series as like the completion of the infrastructure and then going forward, we'll just add new equipment, which will be really fun and juicy and techy and you know, it'll be a great video. So what are we gonna do today? For you guys, you're gonna see all of this in one big part sliced together as you're used to seeing it. For me, this will be spread across a good little while as I am able to film this. Um, but we're gonna start today with a basic little process and something that needs to be done. I'm not looking forward to this step, so once this is done, I'll be much happier and then we can just continue with all the fun stuff. Here is my APC UPS, and you guys may remember I installed this in a previous part of the networking series. Now, several of the comments on that video pointed out something very, very important that I neglected in that video, and it's not something that I really thought about. Now, when I mounted the UPS, I didn't really think about the future necessity of being able to slide out the battery cartridge and replace it with a new battery. Now, as you can see, we've got no warning lights on the UPS at the moment, but the battery that's in here right now is currently fairly fairly dead. It's right at the end of its life. If I power cycle this UPS right now, there's a 50-50 chance that it'll power up with an error light. For those of you who kind of know APC UPSs, their general thing is, at least this one and, and you know several of the older models, when you power them on and there's a dodgy battery, so like a nearly flat battery, or there's a problem with the battery installed. You'll have a red light on the front, which is perfectly fine because it indicates that there's something wrong with the battery and you need to change it, so that's really straightforward. However, one of the really annoying things is it constantly beeps. So you get like, I don't know whether it's every hour or every two hours, you get this long session of beeping. So all through the night you get beeping and it really is quite loud, especially in a, in a quiet house at night time. So I've been needing to change the battery in this guy for the longest time, but I've been putting it off just because of the cost really. But something awesome happened. So up here on my desk, I've got a battery. And I believe the batteries are around 130, 140 quid for my particular model UPS from APC. So I went on to eBuyer, and basically we use these same UPSs in work. So the company that do all of our server maintenance and stuff at work, I phoned them up and I was like, guys, what's the best price you can get me on a replacement battery for an APC UPS? And the price that they could get me was essentially the same as the price on eBuyer. So I went on to eBuyer and it was a little cheaper purchasing a battery from eBuyer than it was purchasing a battery directly from APC. However, when I searched, I found another battery, and this is uh, an even cheaper one again. Completely 100% the same, genuine APC replacement battery cartridge for my UPS. However, this one was open box. It's never been used, but it was open box, and I got it for 66 quid. So I'm so glad I held out because I saved a shed load of cash on the battery upgrade. And this is a brand new battery, should last me a good few years. When I got this, I didn't really know the state of the battery that was in the unit. It worked fine when I got it, but I've had this a couple of years now, so it's done well. So, brand new battery in here. This is number one priority for today. Get the battery in. But as I was explaining, when I originally mounted the UPS, I didn't think about upgrading the battery. So, check this out. You can't actually even get the front panel of the UPS off because of where I've put it in the rack. So, as you guys know, when I bought this UPS, I didn't get any rails or mounting hardware with it. Look, I've screwed that up now. I'm gonna need two hands to get that back on. This is exactly what I'm talking about. I didn't get the mounting hardware, as you guys know. 
So I went on a quest to try and find some proper mounting hardware because when I first got it, I bought this 2U long deep shelf and I plonked it at the bottom of the rack here and it's basically been sitting on this shelf ever since, which is less than ideal. I've got like a piece of rubber propping it up at the back. No, not a good solution at all. That was like my quick solution when I first got it, which was fine, but long term, not good. Because if I wanted to move this up, the shelf wouldn't be able to support the weight of the UPS. So, this brings me on to my next sort of quest to save money. Rails for that guy, at least 150 quid. I didn't even bother getting a proper quote. Legacy discontinued UPS from APC, get proper rails for it, dead expensive. So then I looked at um, getting universal rails. Universal rails that had questionable compatibility with this model would have cost me around 90 quid. So I was still not happy about making that purchase. But then, ah, oh guys, I, I really hope this work out. I really hope this does work out. I decided to go for these puppies. Now this is a 1U rack shelf, 400 mil deep. And it just so happens, if I slide this guy in here, just so happens that the current depth of my rack is exactly 400 mil, so I couldn't believe that when I measured. Now I knew these existed, but I never thought they would have been a viable option because I didn't think that I'd ever line up with the exact depth of one of these shelves. But this is a split shelf. So you've got one half of the shelf here, one half of the shelf here, and the beauty of these guys is they mount at both the front and the back. So you get a lot more security because your UPS is being held up on all four corners. Therefore, it's supported. So that is awesome. Now that's a one new shelf and I could easily just plonk that in, plonk the UPS on top of it and it would work just fine. This is a two U unit, but height makes no difference to plonking something on a shelf. However, we then end up with an ugly gap here in the rack where we'd have alongside the UPS just, you know, a portion showing here, which isn't very nice. So I came up with yet another corner cutting solution and I purchased just some very basic one new universal rack ears. Now these guys will simply screw onto the rack above, well, alongside the UPS in the, the top portion and they will fill in that gap. And they'll also act as little guides either side of the UPS to stop it from slumping either side. So that is fantastic. And what we're gonna do, we're gonna mount the shelf up one U. So we're gonna sacrifice the bottom of the rack here. And what I did is I bought one of these vent panels just to put on the bottom, just to finish the, the cleanliness of the rack. And that's gonna go on the bottom. UPS is gonna go above it. Bish, bash, bosh, job done. It's gonna look good and it's gonna be supported. Now, the only thing that you don't get with my little cheapo solution here versus um, proper rails, is the UPS is not physically attached to anything. But of course, this rack doesn't move anywhere and it's at the bottom of the rack. You know, it's a heavy item, so it's not gonna move around and I'll be able to change batteries freely. Yeah, it won't be screwed to the, the you know, the rails. I have no rails, I didn't go that route just for money reasons, um, but I think it'll be fine. So basically what I'm trying to say is, we are gonna fit the UPS properly today. Now, one little cool point. When I opened the package with these in, I received a lovely little letter and I really hope he doesn't mind me showing it on camera because this is a glorious shout out. It says, Tom, keep up the good work in making videos. Been a subscriber since the days of you building your home studio. That seems ages ago. Yeah, it really does. Thanks for brightening my day. If you need anything, my details are inside. Keep safe, Dan. So, I bought these on eBay, just a random eBay auction, searched for some universal one year rack, universal one U rack ears, bought them, and it turns out that the seller is a subscriber to the channel. And here's his details, I've been on his website, had a little look around, hang on a sec, screensaver. This is his website, DY Pro Audio, and yeah, good selection of stuff. So Dan, I do apologize, buddy. I'm not doing a cool audio project today. You know, when you sent me these, you might have thought that there was something cool audio related coming up. Next time I do a fun audio project, I will definitely look at what you have available. Um, thank you for writing me the letter. 
this is the first time this has ever happened to me, so that's just wonderful. And in return, this also really brightened my day as well. So thank you, buddy. Awesome. But it gets even more exciting. Today I'm waiting for an Amazon delivery and I've ordered two things, two very simple things. One is a 120mm Noctua fan and the other is a pack of two dust filters. Some of you may remember that at the bottom of this rack and indeed also at the top, which I'll probably be able to show, there you go, you can see it on camera right there, there is space for a 120mm fan mount at the top and bottom of the rack. So today, because we are going to be moving the UPS and mounting the UPS in a more permanent position, I'm going to take that opportunity to mount the 120mm intake fan with a dust filter at the bottom of the rack. Now to do this, we are going to have to completely empty the rack, tip the cabinet on its side, get a proper mount going, put the dust filter on the bottom, and then put it all back the right way. And we're going to put all the equipment back in in a different order as well and prep the rack for the future, like I said. So. I've only ordered one fan because I don't currently have the funds available to purchase the additional fans that I'm going to use. I'm going to put a fan in the top. I'm also going to order the kit from Zpass to raise the desktop of this rack, although they haven't been responding to my emails, so I'm a little bit nervous about that. But if worst comes to the worst, we'll just be able to find the hardware to raise it up ourselves. There's just, you know, a couple of spacers will do it. This is just screwed on, so we'll be able to find something to do that because we need to raise this to make a gap for the airflow to come out. So we're going to be mounting a fan in the bottom under the UPS, running the cable out the back, just so that the fan is there ready for when we, when we want to add the rest of the cooling, which is later on in the video when I get some more funds. So it means that we won't have to take the UPS back out, tip the rack back over and just go through all that stress again. So we're doing it right at the beginning and it's going to be a great job out of the way, fan in the bottom of the rack. It won't be powered up right away, but it'll be a step in the right direction to getting the rack cooling completed. That is looking like a bit more of something we can work with. I've moved some of this stuff out of the way. And what I've also done is prepared for the temporary connection that we're going to have. So power here for the time capsule and for the switch. So basically what I'll do is I'll plop that down there, plug it in and plug in the switch as well. So we'll get this out of the rack, plug that in on the floor over there, plug all of the network lines into the switch, plug that into the router and then we'll have access to like everything downstairs. Just in case this takes me a little longer than I think it will, you know, I can always leave it overnight. Um, that way I'm not worried about getting anything back up and running. The only thing, of course, we won't have is any of the servers, but we'll have internet access to all of our devices and we'll have the access point downstairs working and things like that. So that's the best way that I can think about doing it. And just like that, we've got both of our items, presumably filters and a fan. Let's check it out. So for the dust filters, I could only get them in a pack of two, so I only really need one. Don't need to filter the exhaust I'll eventually be adding, but... Um, I went for these ones that have a little magnetic frame on them. I thought, because I wasn't sure how I was going to be mounting these, I kind of thought magnetic frame will open up a few more possibilities for me just in case I need them. Because I am going to try and use the rubber fan mounts because vibration is a little bit of an issue in this uh, rack. We'll be addressing that a little bit later as well, or trying to address it at least with the kind of limited supplies I have. Um, as for the fan, you know, went for the, the quality option, chose the Noctua NFS12A FLX, um, you know, basically for reliability. Um, reliability, good quality, quietness, you know, all the reasons why we choose Noctua fans. Not cheap, um, but worth it, because this is going to be in the cabinet until well, for the foreseeable future, I want it to last, I want it to be a quality option, so I can only get one right now, I'll get another one further on down the line uh, for the top. Okay guys, I've shut down the three machines that are in the rack, I'm going to pull everything out that I can pull out without disrupting the internet, then I'm going to do a quick changeover to the outside of the rack router setup.
Okay, so this is what we're left with, and you can see the state of disorganisation that the rack has sort of arrived in over all this time. Um, I'm basically going to do the quick changeover now. All the equipment is out, and just sort of spread across the place here. Um, do the quick changeover. Literally one minute to get this lot swapped down to the bottom there. Let's do it. Okay, we are up. Green light on the router. Switch powered up. The drops to downstairs. Some in the switch, some in the router. And we're back up. That's my main machine. So I've got network to my main machine, which is important. And now we can safely power down the rack because it is doing nothing. There we go. All done. I can strip all this out and we can, I guess, start hoovering out and then we'll do the UPS. It's quite a big task. <laughs> empty apart from the two PDUs, one 13 amp, one IEC. So they're going to sit in there for now, they will be altered later on in the video. But what I'm going to do now is go and get the hoover, get this clear so that we can fit the new rails. So after a little hoover we are looking pretty good guys. Now there's the fan filter and the plan is, it's going to be a nightmare to clean but the plan is, plonk it there and there's still you know, somewhat decent ventilation. Um, let's unbox the fan, see how we're going to mount this. I'm 90% sure we'll have to flip this rack on its side in order to screw in from the bottom. So it's always a treat getting a knock to a fan. This one is optimised for airflow as opposed to pressure. Here we go. So here it is in the classic brown, lovely noise dampening corners here. The standard cable is quite short, but I believe they include an extension. Uh, yes, I think that's an extension. And um, I went for the three pin one, obviously, didn't need the PWM because this is simply gonna be powered straight from a 12 volt transformer eventually. But there you have it. That is the kind of thing we're aiming for. And it's pointless putting the filter on this side because it'll be even harder to reach because the UPS is gonna be there. But, yeah, I thought it would have been a little bit kind of pointless putting the fans in when I first got the rack, but seeing a 120 mil fan sitting in here, I can see that the airflow will be definitely beneficial. Better than nothing, anyway. So, we've got a couple of the low noise adapters included. We're not going to use those, I believe. Yes, this is just an extension, so we'll use this in order to extend, because we will need to extend. And it's going to be hard to do that after we install the UPS. So, plugging that in. There we go. That's a much better amount of cable to work with. I've pushed the rubber mounts up from the bottom simply by lifting the rack ever so slightly. Will this work? Will I be able to plonk this on top and pull them through? Let's have a look. Check that out, guys. I'm chuffed a bit. It's in. It's in and looking sweet. I am so happy. That is awesome. So it's on the rubber mounts and yeah, it's not, not touching any metal. So, I mean, vibration should be really minimal so chuffed 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 if I didn't go for an Octua fan I wouldn't have got the rubber mounts and I wouldn't have been able to fit it so perfect and I didn't have to tip the rack over brilliant and of course whoosh, intake moment of truth is just around the corner I've mounted in the split rack shelf 
the wannabe rack rails as well as the one new rack ears just sitting there they'll be quite handy actually because they protrude more than the shelf so they should provide a little bit of kind of um, friction when we move the UPS in and there's a little bit of playroom because obviously I can move them ever so slightly here on the rack strips I can just you know pull them in a little bit if we need to um, one thing that really winds me up about these vent panels is because they lose a lot of their structural integrity with all these holes in them They tend to bend in postage and you can see there's a slight bend in this one Just makes the whole thing look absolutely horrible So what I'll probably do this will be easy to swap out at a later date even when the UPS is sat above it What I'll probably do is swap it out for one that's more solid um, It's half the reason why I bought this because I wanted to try again. I've got a couple that don't have the 90 degree angle on them. They're just straight one U pieces and they are flimsy as anything. So I wanted to try these, but no, these have a similar problem. Not quite as bad, but pretty bad. So I'm gonna pop you guys on the tripod and we will try and plonk in the UPS. The clearance, by the way, between the shelf, so the bottom of the UPS and the fan is approximately an inch. I could have moved the UPS up to here, so to you from the bottom, but didn't want to get too high in the rack and of course it eats into my equipment space so let's plonk the UPS in see what it looks like anyway okay I've given it a bit of a clean here we go That is way better. The only thing I need is a little bit of rubber or something just to stop it sliding because it's very, very slippery. So I need to order some really thin rubber feet to hold this in. But what I've done now, just as a sort of temporary measure, is I chopped up, I had two of these underneath the old UPS shelf. I've chopped them up and I just crammed them down the side here just to add some sort of compression so that you can't move the UPS now. The reason I've left the front hanging out is because it gives me plenty of clearance at the back for the cabling. And check this out. We now have access to change the battery, which is what we will do pretty soon. Maybe even now. Okay guys, the unit is powered on, plugged in, ready to go. That's the cool thing about these APCs, the batteries are completely hot swappable, so nothing's actually affected if you swap it while the system is on. So that's another good advantage to having it in a place in the rack where you can actually access it. Because you don't have to power anything down or alter any systems to change a battery, which is great. So. Here we go. Here's a big beefy APC battery pack. It's looking smaller than I would expect, but we may be okay because in work we've got the 1500s and this is only a 1000, so hoping that everything is still okay. I might just be accustomed to seeing the bigger ones. Here we go. So this is someone's homemade battery, as you can see, which is absolutely fine, perfectly acceptable, but we're replacing it with a APC original. Okay, come on, baby. 
sagen. Now we just need to get this little bracket screw back on. There we have it. Job done guys. Something I've been meaning to do for the longest time and now it's done. We've got a brand new battery installed. It's the following day and I made some progress yesterday evening. I decided to take the back of the rack off and make a start at the back here because I've come up with a use for these spare shelves. Now I don't need to put either of these shelves back in. These are kind of shallow ones. This is a really deep one. This is probably about 400 mil, uh, 450 mil, 500. Maybe it's really, really deep. Um, I don't need that one for anything, but these guys, what I'm gonna use them for is I'm gonna mount them on the back here and I'm gonna use them to support my two heaviest items. So there's a surprising amount of weight in Monster Raid. So I'm gonna support its back end with the shelf. It won't look any different from the front. It'll just be much less strain on the front rack strips here. And I'm also gonna support Scaro with a shelf. And I think it'll all work out just fine. So of course, to do that properly, I need good access to the back. And while I was back here, I thought, even though I don't have all the components that I need to do what I want to do with the rack, I may as well modify things ever so slightly in preparation. So I've moved the PDUs. I've put the IEC one right down the bottom here in this one U space above the UPS. It just means that all the IEC connections are close together, which is great, so I can route them all along the side here. And I've put the 13 amp one right at the top. And there's no real reason for that. It just means that I can keep all of it out the way. I don't have anything in the way here restricting what I can do with shelves and whatnot. I haven't put it up here for any particular reason. The only thing that really needs to get powered from this guy is transformers. And there's plenty of space at the top for the bulkier bricks, so that's great. And I can easily stow away the little annoying fiddly 12 volt transformer wires. I can store them away at the top here, bundled together quite neatly, or just off to the side. So I'm really quite pleased with where I've positioned the PDUs. You'll also notice that I've flipped them round. When I last configured the rack, I did everything from the front. This time, because I'm adding quite a bit at the back, I've flipped them round and I've decided that if I want to adjust anything at the back, I'll do it from the back end because I'm not gonna be able to get in from the front. And it has been a constant pain to try and do that, to be honest. And I guess in the future, if the rack is ever fully populated, then of course I won't be able to get in from the front. So I'll have to, I'll have no choice but to get in from the back. So that's working out perfectly fine. Another really cool thing is while I was back here, I had a little look at this fan and apologies for the frame going all wonky and things. Check out how much clearance is between the fan and the bottom of the UPS. It's actually much more than I realized from the front. So that's great. The idea is, yes, the fan is blowing directly into the bottom of the UPS. There's not a lot we can really do about that. I've raised it up as much as I think is acceptable, but the air will hit the bottom of the UPS and then it'll sort of dissipate and hopefully come around the edges and just travel up the rack slowly. It'll at least provide fresh air intake because if the front door is closed and the back door is closed, everything is closed up and sealed, you've got a little bit of cool air coming in from somewhere. So the eventual plan is of course to put another fan at the top for exhaust and then we'll have some sort of airflow. Uh, another quick point, the back door, here we have uh, the cable inlets. I never did take out all of them. I've got the middle panel on both the bottom and the top um, still intact here. They make brush plates, and in fact, I've got one here, and I'll be fitting it during this video at some point. Uh, can I reach it? Yes. 
I've got it. So with the rack, they provided these brushes. Now, I am gonna fit them because it looks a lot neater and I'll take out the middle in order to do that. But I've only got the one, so I need another one. And something else really cool that I haven't planned, but I'm gonna go for it in this video, is I'm gonna take out all of these bottom cutouts because I kind of figured out, folks, that I don't really need any cables routing through the back door. Because when I raise the top, anything that sat on top of the rack, I can punch out Oh no, I don't even need to punch them out. They're, it's already open, so there's a big open space above the rack here. So the cabling for the printer and the hard drive dock and the time capsule that all sit on top can all come out of there. They currently come out of here. They'll have to do that until I'm able to raise this wooden top. Um, but the cabling for the, the network, the network cabling and the power and anything that needs to come in can all come in underneath here. So that is absolutely ideal. I'm gonna do that and then not a single thing will be going through the door. And that'll make it a lot easier to open the door because there's a very short earth cable attaching the door here so while there are no cables running through it you can just angle the door outwards and lean it against the side of the rack if I have network cables going through the door and I cable manage them all neatly in the rack and then put them into the patch panel it's going to be a, a royal pain to get the back door off with enough clearance I'd have to unbolt the, the earth cable and then just feed the door backwards with the cable still going through it so Long story short, we are going to try not to use any of these holes, eventually. So by the end of this video, you should see all of this completely free, and hopefully with brushes on, because they provided this with the rack, and the people that make the rack, Z-Pass, they do have more available. However, I did hear that they're no longer shipping product to the UK. All of their auctions and whatnot, they used to sell a lot on eBay, they're all completely gone. And I have emailed them about the desktop riser kit, and they haven't emailed me back. So, I don't really know what to say. Um, but, anyway, that doesn't really matter. We should be able to source this from somewhere else. Because I think it's just a generic part. It even says something else on it. So I doubt they make it. Um, and then, you know, I'll just do this myself. But yeah, let's, um, let's continue. We'll try and pop the shelves in the correct place. It's gonna take me a little bit of head work to figure out where they need to go. But the cool thing is, guys, I have mapped out all of my equipment here along the side. So we've got a uh, one new space free here for a future piece of equipment that'll be going above the patch panel. Then I'm gonna put my switch directly below the patch panel this time. Another one new space for a, a future piece of equipment. Then we'll have Scaro there. Then we'll have, um, no sorry, we'll have a vent panel there. We'll have Scaro there. We'll have the Mac Mini 2U shelf here, Monster Raid here. And then we've got 3U, exactly 3U of spare space in this rack, which is incredible. So I was suspicious that this was gonna be the case. Um, because of the shelf, we are now ever so slightly too high and we don't line up with any specific point. So what I'm gonna try and do is flip the shelf upside down. So just completely flip it and that way it should be flush with, I don't know, kind of flush, I think. Hmm, it's hard to know really, but um, yeah, I'm gonna flip it upside down above this PDU and see how that goes. But you can see the theory, you know, you get a lot of support at the back and it's great, you know, it, it, I, I think that's going to work really nicely. It just neatens things up as well. It just saves all the equipment just dangling there and I worry about the front. Um, another cool thing that I want to show you guys is I'm just figuring out the Mac Mini shelf. So we are ditching the old Firewire drives. They no longer need to be on the setup. I've got a massive, massive um, Synology NAS. There is no excuse to keep hanging on to random drives. I mean, one's a two terabyte, which is, okay, fair enough, but the other's a 750 gig. So it's taking up a load of rack space, and the only reason they're still there is because I'm so disorganized, and I'm nervous that there are files on there that I need to access. But all I have to do is plug it in externally, and just dump all the files onto the NAS, and then I don't need the drives anymore, and I can use them for off-site backup and stuff. So what I'm doing is I'm just configuring the Mac Mini shelf. Now, I've got this drive here. This is a three terabyte external. I'm keeping this on the shelf for one reason. Firstly, well not firstly, there's only one reason. I've got space to keep it. So the Mac Mini occupies this space. There's space here, I've got the power supply here. May as well keep this on the setup. It's an additional three terabytes of space. 
I can use it for backups and things like that. It's currently got data stored on it um, that also needs to get organized on the NAS, but I can easily use this for just extra storage, which is great. You know, more storage is always good. Um, I've got this nice short USB cable linking it to the Mac Mini. Found this really handy. Um, I'll tidy up the cables, tie them all down, route all the power this way and dust the shelf, dust all the components and then this will be ready to go in in one piece and this will be the only shelf in the front of the rack. So we'll do that next. What I'm going to do first though is try and flip that shelf around and see if that works. Guys, I'm gutted. That plan would have worked because as you can see the spacing of the shelf is below the fixing point so that would have been fine but there's a lip there's a lip both sides i knew there was one at the front but there's one at the back so if i was to put this in upside down look, then you've just got a lip pointing up at the front ah gutted 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 what i might do is put it in hmm Put it in the right way up, but just move it one notch down, I guess. See if that does anything. Well guys, that actually worked. I took the shelf down one notch, and I was kind of, you know, thinking that if I did that, when I tightened the front here, it would kind of angle up as it would straighten, and then there would be a gap between the back end and the shelf. But no, it's perfect. The shelf is supporting it perfectly. Um, my only slight concern now is because of this portion here, will the Mac Mini shelf go above it? So the Mac Mini shelf doesn't look like much currently. It's not really looking that neat, but it's functional. So, I need to give you questions. two seconds, okay, he's two seconds. I'm just gonna do this one quick thing. I've tied down the USB and the power cable there. The brick is still sitting in the middle, attached. This is a little bit of a mess, but I was trying to force the cable opposite to how it's meant to be going. So it just sits there neatly, doesn't move. It takes up the slack. You won't see it anyway, because it'll be in the rack. Um, and then these two power cables are tied down this side of the shelf so that they come out the correct side of the rack for the power routing. So I'm gonna plop this in now and see how it looks when it's in there. So we've just mounted Scaro in the same successful way. Not quite as perfect as Monster Raid. It's leaning back ever so slightly, but in my plan anyway, I've got a vent panel to go above this. So there's vent panel here, piece of equipment here, switch, piece of equipment. So we're gonna get a vent here and this is exactly 3U under here. So what we'll do is we'll get a nice, because there's no equipment plan to go here at all. This is my complete spare space, no plans at all. All of this is planned with future, future equipment purchase, but this is completely spare and open. So we'll get a nice vented rack plate here just to cover up the front for now. And what we can do, obviously, if we get another piece of 1U equipment, we can step up down to a 2U vent panel and just keep the neatness, you know, consistent. Um, let's take a little look around the back then at the shelves that are supporting everything. Apologies for the camera work, guys. It's a little bit cramped. As you guys can see, uh, I don't know if you can tell on camera. You can't actually. It's very, very hard to tell. But Scaro is leaning back just a shade. Um, the front screws are completely tight. So it's kind of good, really, that, you know, I've got the shelf because it really does show how much strain. Um, these systems were putting on the, the mounts at the front there. So you can see this is now looking nice and populated at the back and is holding everything nice and steady. One thing that really baffles me about Scaro is normally you find all the power along one side. Um, oh wait, hang on, has this got the power on the wrong side? Let's think. No, no. I believe this is the correct side of the rack for power. This is the incorrect side. I do believe. So if that is around the wrong way, then that baffles me because that is, um, you know, this is meant to be like my most professional piece of equipment that I have. The only thing that's kind of, I'm struggling with now, hang on a sec guys, kids are going bananas today. I've chosen the worst day to do this. Um, I just want to show you guys one quick thing down here. I'm not that pleased with the power cable behind the hard drive there. Um, it's just kind of, a bit messy but 
now that Scaro's in, you can't see it at all. So I can, because I've got access from the back now, I can always redo it anyway. So I need to go out to the shed to find my vent panel. That can go above here. And um, we need to put in the switch. Um, this is going to look ugly as for now because um, we don't have that equipment. I'll order a 3U vent panel when I order, order the rest of the stuff. And one thing I was thinking, uh, oh, whoops, one thing I was thinking was I didn't know how everything was going to look at the back here, but we've got quite a lot of possibilities back here for various mounting. So what I may do to assist that bottom fan, we've got a fan coming in from the bottom, uh, blowing out exhaust through the top eventually. So I may add some kind of fan back here to assist with the travel of air. So the main systems here that I'm concerned about suck air in through the front and blow it out the back. So we've got exhaust here, exhaust here. So in theory, there's gonna be a lot of residual heat here. If I can add a fan here-ish, that pulls up and assists that top exhaust fan, that would be really cool. So I could look into um, possible mounting scenarios for that. What I'm thinking of at the moment is, you can get nice 120 mil, uh, 19 inch rack plates, but they just mount the fan vertically in the rack. So what I might do is get a really short depth rack shelf, just a one U rack shelf, mount it here underneath this power strip and then I would be able to drill a nice big round hole in the middle, or even two, and get two Noctuas sitting here. That might be possible. But all of that is to be decided. Got a little bit of a gap here. You know, it's all good. It's all looking good. I'm pleased with this progress, guys. So, um, yeah, I'm going to call it a day. Well, I'm going to call it a morning for this particular session because I need to go and wear out the kids, get rid of some of their energy, and then we'll come back later and we'll start wiring some of this stuff in. So it's later in the day and I've just been out to the shed and found two one new blank plates that are nice and vented. They're pretty much the same as that one that we ordered and popped in the bottom there. So I'm gonna put a blank plate in the position where a blank plate is actually gonna be with the final build. It's gonna look a bit odd because the rack is incomplete, but at least we will then have like everything in place and then we can get the switch in. I just need to do a little bit of jiggery pokery with the connections. So I've got the router running with the downstairs network drops plugged directly into it. So there is no effect to the network in the rest of the home whatsoever. The rack is now completely independent, including the switch, which is what we want to mount next. So I've given it a quick wipe over. Now, while I'm mounting this, folks, I'm going to chat to you just ever so slightly. Check this out, guys. I always forget this isn't a rack mount unit. It's just got long rack brackets on it to adapt it. It's actually smaller than... Uh, than most 24 port switches. That's why the whole thing is kind of centralized. Um, I want to chat to you guys. This switch is going back in now, but this will be temporary. I am basically changing things up um, with the network and I'm going to go much more managed. So I'm getting a managed switch and I am changing pretty much my entire approach to my, my entire approach to all of the equipment. So we are gonna be rebuilding it from the ground up. Not physically, this is what we're doing in this video, but what we are doing as well is prepping for the additional equipment. So I'm mounting everything in, in place just like as if I have the new equipment here so that I can deploy it really quickly when I get it. So some of the wiring we do around the back will be a little bit interesting and strange for this particular setup, but it'll all make sense when we get the new gear. Now, part of this is where I'm mounting the switch right now. If you guys remember, last time I simply had a brush plate in between and I tried to put patch cables neatly through the brush plate and uh, none of that really worked out. We're ditching that entire idea and we're gonna do it the proper way. So I don't have them yet because it's surprisingly expensive to get 24 of them, but we're gonna be using much longer patch cables. As you guys know, I've been through two or three different revisions of how I've tried to patch from my patch panel to the switch, and you run into the same problems every time. And last time I did it, it just looked plain ugly. So what I'm gonna do now in this part, don't have the, don't have the kit yet, unfortunately, 24 
two meter patch cables. We're going to run them all from the ports, cable tie them back neatly, shove them around the side, make a service loop, and we're going to port them all round to the front of the switch. We're going to plug them all in. We're also going to do a similar appro approach to wiring in the switch. So up until now, I have used really short cables, such as these ones, which I believe are probably about half a meter long. These are the cables I've been using to patch in the equipment from the back of the patch panel to the rest of the rack. We're going to change that up and we're actually going to be using the same two meter cables and we're going to create a big service loop on top of the switch. So the new switch is going to be a lot bigger in size. We've got the patch panel directly on top of it. We're going to have a service loop. There's a piece of equipment going here. So what we're essentially, essentially trying to achieve here, folks, is serviceability of the patch panel because I need to be able to access the back of it easily without pulling the rack out, without pulling everything out. So taking a lot of inspiration and you know I have to I have to mention him because without him I wouldn't have known half of the stuff about these patch panels in the first place. So Fibre Ninja taking a huge huge uh, amount of his advice. The serviceability, yeah, this is a home network, but the way I did this before, it was a royal pain in the ass to get to the back of the patch panel to plug stuff in. So we're gonna create that service loop, both at the front with the patch cables going off to the side in a nice dressed, neat loop, and we'll do it the same for the actual network feeds in the back. So we can just unscrew it, pull it out, and plop it on top of the rack, and do whatever we need to do with it. So that is what we're gonna go for, folks. And it'll also look neater as well. We'll have a wad of cable going off to the side here, and we'll have a wad of cable going off to the side here, and there'll be a big loop down the side. And I'll show you where I'm thinking of storing some of the slack and whatnot a little bit later on. But that's why we've got the switch directly mounted underneath the patch panel. Now the brush panel idea would have worked okay if I did it slightly differently. We don't really need to worry about it now um, because we are obviously changing the approach. But what I could have done, and I should have thought about this when I did it. I should have bought longer patch pan, uh, longer patch cables. And uh, look, I've pretty much ruined this panel, folks. When I did this, what I should have done is taken all 24 feeds, looped them directly in, which is what I did do. But my problem was I brought them back out the same brush panel and into the switch. There wasn't enough room. What I should have done was taken all the feeds from the switch, take them off to the side, brought them back round through the brush panel and into the patch panel. That would have been much neater, but I would have required longer cables, uh, which I didn't buy. The last time when I went for patch cables, I decided to buy, let's have a look. I decided to buy these guys. These are 25 centimeters maybe. So we're gonna reuse some of these just for now as a temporary thing because we're only gonna plug in the circuits that we're actually using. So any lines that we have anything connected to, there's probably only gonna be about eight or 10 ports used on this patch panel right now. We'll only plug those in because we don't have anywhere to store this slack uh, until we wire things properly. So that's just a quick explanation while we were fitting the switch. This is permanent. Um, that's in its rightful place, just to give a bit of breathing room above the NAS. Obviously, because all of the kind of hot equipment is sandwiched together, we've got um, the Monster Raid with the shelf directly above it and the Synology ra NAS directly above it. Um, we're talking, you know, a big sort of pool of heat here. So we'll do some effort with fans in the back, like I was trying to talk about earlier. We've got a vent panel above, so that the equipment that goes here, the equipment that's gonna be going here doesn't produce a lot of heat, but there'll still be a piece of equipment here, and there'll be a piece of equipment here, and of course the new switch that will be here. Um, so, we will try and contain the heat and dissipate it and move it around where we wanna move it, basically. But this panel is permanent, this one is not. What I'll probably do, I might have one in work, actually. I'll check it out next time I visit there. Um, a 3U blanking panel, it can be vented, not vented, won't really make much of a difference. Um, I've got a 2U one up in the attic, so I could have a 2U one with this 1U, but it's a different design, it's going to look a bit janky. So if I can get a 3U panel here, just to fill in the gap for now, that would be nice. I have been looking at some lovely um, rack mount cases, some short depth rack mount cases, and what I wouldn't mind doing is getting some of the spare parts I have and building a 2U server um, 
and basically use it for experimental purposes, uh, run a few virtual machines, just have a play around and just sort of grow my knowledge a little bit um, because obviously then I'll have the best of all worlds. I'll have a really flexible server that I can basically do anything I want on. I'll have my Mac side of things where obviously you guys know, you know, I live within Mac OS. Everything I do is Mac. So it's really lovely having a 24 seven Mac running. A lot of people were surprised when I bought Scaro, my rack station here by Synology, a lot of people were surprised that I was retaining the Mac Mini functionality. Scaro is absolutely amazing and you can do some incredible things with Synology DSM, but it's still nice to have a Mac running 24 hours a day. It really, really is nice. So I do a couple of things on there. Of course, I've got the Synology stuff that I can play with, but just having that extra system that I can play with as well will be quite fun. But that's for way down the line. Just wanted to explain that maybe something will fill this gap in the future. But right now, we are not focused on that side. We are more focused on the networking portion, which is going to be up here. And damn, it is going to look nice. It's already looking pretty sexy up here now, folks. It's going to look really, really nice when all this is done. So that is the front of the rack complete. We've got nothing else to put in it. One thing I do want to point out as well, which is kind of a coincidence. I, I didn't design it in this way at all, but it's definitely quite nice. Even though, like I was saying, we've got a sandwich of equipment here and all of this takes up, you know, this is a lot of heat. There's a drive here, there's two drives here, so that's three drives, seven drives, 11 drives. So there's 11 hard drives in here, plus two computers and all of their various heat producing things, power transformer. Um, so, you know, a bit of heat here, but something quite cool is obviously there's a void under here. This is just the nature of the 2U shelf, because the Mac Mini is too tall for a 1U shelf. The newer Mac Minis fit in a 1U shelf, but this is slightly too tall, so you need a 2U. But then you get this nice breathing space above it. But of course, underneath as well, we've got breathing space above Monster Raid, because you can see there in that hole, there's a good gap between the shelf because of this lip. So there's an entire void under the shelf, so they're not completely touching each other, which is nice. So if there's a sort of travel of air in the case, in the cabinet, there'll be a little travel of air above Monster Raid as well, which is nice. And of course, there's nothing wrong with having, I could, you know, stack this and this directly on top of each other. You know, they're, they're rack mount equipment. They're designed to be stacked on top of each other. But it's just nice knowing that in an environment like a home network, if you were stacking this stuff in, in a server room in a, an office or a school or a, some kind of corporate environment, uh, whatever, the likelihood is the, the equipment will only be in service for like three years or five years or whatever, and then, you know, whatever budget comes along and you, you buy more equipment. At home, it's a case of trying to like prolong the life of your equipment as much as possible and keep it all going. So you want to keep it all cool. And you want to try and squeeze as much life of it uh, out of it as possible. Um, I do anyway, you know, some people probably have the kind of disposable income to throw away at this sort of thing. But for me, this is, this is stuff that I've really got to work for folks. So just a little bit of extra cooling room here makes me very happy to see. And it gives me great comfort knowing that this stuff should be getting some fresh air now, because I have been worried about it, especially playing around with falling at home and, and building up quite a bit of heat in this room. Man, that top fan is going to have a lot of breathing space as well. Really nice. Okay, let's go around back and start fiddling around. So I've closed the door at the front and I've pushed the rack back a little bit more to give us some more space back here because we're going to be spending quite a bit of time back here wiring everything up now. You guys can see the back of the Mac Mini is also quite accessible, which is really nice. Um, I was right, folks. It is this side that all the power is meant to be. Um, typically in the rack mount gear you find all the power on that side. It's so odd that this rack station has the power over here. It's really frustrating. Obviously I don't mind. I only run two cables to this thing. When I get a managed switch I'll be running um, three cables because I'll run the two network cables which would be lovely. Um, but I can just run that along the shelf. Makes no difference. Uh, one thing as well, we'll get this power strip and we'll tack that cable up there out of the way, make a nice little run here. Now what I have done, I've dug out my uh, detachable cable ties because we can't really permanently tie anything down because we are going to have new equipment. So I've got a couple of different lengths of detachables just to hold everything in a temporary state. You're going to hear that word a lot, you probably have already, temporary. Um, first we'll get these PDUs wired in nicely to the UPS, then we'll get the main power line running into the rack through the bottom here, we'll get these plates out. 
And uh, yeah, for those of you wondering, there's the time capsule and the four drops plugged into the back of it. One of them's a WAN feed and then three lamb going down. That one looks like it's falling out. So I've made a little start, guys. It looks rough as, just because we've got a lot of these um, reusable cable ties just temporarily floating here. Now, I'm safe to attach power cabling to this portion here because this is less than one U. Nothing is going to be mounted here. So these holes I can tie to freely. But what I don't want to do is tie anything to these holes as such because um, I could well be mounting stuff here if I want to do some of that fan stuff I was on about. Now, one bummer is I shouldn't really be coming across here like this. I should be going round. But you cannot fit a 13 amp plug through this side. Now, you may just think, okay, take the plug off and whip it round. But yeah, that's all well and good. What do I do with the transformer? Now, this is my fault for prepping the rack shelf first and tying all that down because that cable I could easily pull the other end through. So that's something that I need to redo, unfortunately. But we're not going to do that right now because the fact of the matter is, power wise, it's very difficult to get neat because you're working with such different types of cables. You've got some of these, you've got some of these, and you've got some of these chunkers. So it's very difficult in the first place. Plus, we've got new equipment coming. So we're going to have a load more power cable coming down. So I may as well redress the whole power cable situation when we've got the new gear in. As long as it's tied up neatly for now, that's all I really care about. The way I manage this lot is I've got my two PDUs attached directly to the UPS. So this one is the 13 amp PDU at the top. And I've got the cable for that just tucked along the back of it there. And then it runs down and I've got loop for both PDUs just in the corner of the rack here, just down the bottom alongside the UPS, so that's great. They don't protrude at all past the bottom end, so that's good. Um, so the two PDUs are attached there. This is my Synology NAS, Scaro, this guy here. So this gets a direct connection to the UPS, and if I was ever to add another PC, or a server, whatever, I'd attach it here, straight to the UPS. This guy is currently powering the switch and it's powering Monster Raid. So I put the smaller devices, this one and this one, on the PDU. So that's really cool. That is pretty much it for power cabling. Everything has juice in here, except for the items that sit on top of the rack, but they will come a little bit later. We will get some of this um, bottom end cabling done first, so some of the network cabling up to the patch panel and whatnot. It looks a complete mess, and it is indeed a complete mess, but everything is plugged in. Now, I kind of realized when I was trying to tie things neatly and whatnot that all of this is gonna be redone anyway because of all the fans and stuff we're gonna add. Um, so coupling that with the new gear, there's no point wasting too much time on this today because later on in this video we're going to sort it all out anyway. So what I've done is I've knocked out the bottom plate of the rack. I've run these two pink lines through. These aren't going to anything, they'll just be coiled up behind the rack and that's basically for anything that I want to plug in on the test bench or additionally in the room. I've got this black line here that's temporarily ran from my main system. That's going through one of the top holes in the door. Um, that's patched in as well, so my main system. So in addition to the main system in the room, I've got these two pink lines for additional systems, basically, that I can plug into Ethernet without um, fiddling with the patch panel at all. Of course, there's a lot of spare space at the front, so if worst comes to the worst, I can just patch straight in, you know? I can plug into the switch at the front and have the door open if I need a third device. But what I don't want to do is add loads of Ethernet cables just hanging out the back of the rack for no reason at this stage. So all of this slack is eventually going to be divvied out in between sort of some slack in the rack and some slack in the house underneath the floor here um, but for now it's a bit awkward now because I'm at the stage where we can essentially power this up and get this running but it will mean terminating this for about five-ish minutes while I get things up and running so I'm going to go and see what the guys are doing uh, I've ran out all the cabling that I need to for the printer, the airport and the dock. So they're all running out of the appropriate holes. So it'll just be a case of hinging the door back in. And as you can see, nothing in the bottom holes now. So much better like this. This is something I should have done from the beginning. I just didn't really think. And we are back. So we've got my three devices 
on top here. It's going to be so much easier when I get a network printer. But this is the story with the printer, right? I've never spoken about it. I've always just had it here. It's just a USB printer, basic Canon um, scanner and stuff, you know, from about 10, maybe 12 years ago. And the thing is, I print something once every blue moon and it's never anything that important. And I just can't dedicate money to buy myself a new printer until this one breaks and it's just clonking on forever. So yeah, it's slow. It's got no network capabilities, it's old, it's loud, it, you know, takes forever, but I don't print anything, so I can't bring myself to buy a new one, folks. So until then, we'll be running the USB and hosting it through Mac Mini, um, sorry, Mac OS print sharing on the Mac Mini. Um, so we've got the back panel in position, and you guys can see exactly everything that's running through it. So the majority of what's coming out of this cutout is for these guys, so the airport, WAN and LAN and power. Then we've got power and data for the dock and we've got power for the printer. Then out of this guy, we've got the data for the printer as well as the network feed that's going up and around the door down there to my main setup as a temporary cable. Um, that All of that will be going away and coming out underneath the top here when this is raised and that is going to be really nice. Speaking of all of that going away, you guys can see we've got nothing going in the bottom here. It is all going in underneath, which is lovely. So it's not properly managed or anything at the moment because all of those cables are going to be pulled back out anyway in order to run under the floor. Um, and then at the front, basically all I've done, we've got nine patches total, folks. So nine on the inside here, so I got all short patch cables. I added an extra three patch cables here just in case we patch any more devices in. It'll be really easy to, because I can get my arm all the way back, so it'll just be a case of running a cable in and plugging it into the patch panel. So that's perfect. Um, but these are all my devices, so my three drops downstairs, the router, everything in the rack, and my main setup, and the, uh, the two pink lines that are running out haven't got any of the servers powered up because obviously I need to move the rack back into position. So before we power anything up, we'll do that. But at the moment, the switch is up, the router is up, and the internet is working. So that is the main thing. So here's how we're looking, guys. Back panel back on, and that's how clean it will look when everything's coming out the bottom. So that's nice. Black power cable, four network cables, a bundle behind the rack, two pink ones coming out the side. Job done, let's push it all back. Ah, listen to that lovely whir of hard drives. We are back up and running. So Scaro is just booting up. Venus is just booting, but <laughs> booting up. Monster Raid is off on the main power switch on the back. And as you guys know, that is because dead drives, not that one specifically this one dead so I need new drives in that guy that'll come later as well um, but for now Scaro Venus booting up lovely and clean and check this out door closed gorgeous nice even though this rack is far from done it's already looking ten times better in my opinion right then gonna jump onto my main system check that I can see both the servers Make sure everything's back up and running and then I am ready to do the cleanup. So both systems popped back up wonderfully. We've got Venus and it's popped right back into the folding job that it was on and we've also got Scaro. Uh, so yeah, perfect. Couldn't be better. So I am copying 2.61 terabytes of data over USB 2.0 and I thought I'd show this little clip because it's probably been quite a while since some of you have copied anything over USB 2.0, at least anything of this size. You know, if you're dealing with folders this big, then you are probably um, running equipment that is capable of better transfer speeds. So what I'm currently doing, guys, let me, let me turn off the fan here. Um, by the way, it's a couple of days later once again. Network rack is has been up and running for a few days now, so it's all working great. But what I'm now doing is looking at the next phase. So I'm copying, that 2.61 terabytes of data is on this drive. I'm copying it to 
Scaro, and we're going through the Mac Mini. It would have been quicker because Sc Scaro has a USB 3.0. I could have connected this drive directly to it and it would have been quicker. But it's connected to this Mac Mini with a short cable and cable tied on. So I don't need it to happen quickly anyway. This is a process that will take ages. So I, it can just do its thing. Then I can erase this drive. And my plan is, guys, I'm going to try and get this Monster Raid up to a capacity of around 3 terabytes or so. I'll get four one terabyte WD Reds, put them in here, and then I can use this three terabyte drive as a daily backup of this guy. I am now hoping in the next couple of days to put in the order for the rest of the components for the rack for this video. So pretty soon you guys will be seeing the next portion where we add the additional cooling, the additional cabling, and finish tidying things up with this guy. But for now, we are done. So. Thank you for sticking with me so far. I think we're already about an hour in, which is crazy. Okay, guys, it's about a week later and we are ready to carry on with the network finishing touches. Now, one of the big ones was the TV drop. So in the last video, I prepared the majority of it, but I didn't finish it. What I then did was in the last entertainment setup video, if you haven't seen that, go and check that out, because what I did was I actually popped an ethernet jack behind the TV setup on the wall, and I ran it along here, and I basically got loose Cat 6 in the gas meter box here that is ready to be worked on today. So I can't actually get to that right now, because I'm hoping to do this without pulling the TV out too much. So what I'll do is I'll just overlay a picture of what I did. There's two network jacks there. One's for the projector feed in the future. The other one is for the actual feed from the network. Um, and by doing this today, we will be eliminating the power line feed. So at the moment, we've got the power line adapter here. We've got this loose Cat6 cable that runs across the floor. This will be completely gone. What we're doing is swapping that with this nice short Cat6 cable that will go from the wall jack straight into the 8-port switch that's mounted on the bottom of the TV cabinet. And we'll be using this nifty little keystone jack here, RJ45 to RJ45, to connect both of the terminated ends of Cat6. So one run of Cat6 is already there. That's the one that's coming from the socket on the wall currently, so that's absolutely fine. All we need to do is put an RJ45 connector on it. So we'll do that first, and what I'll do is I'll plug that straight into the power line adapter, and then we can have the TV running while I'm fiddling with everything else. So if we take a quick look in the cupboard, I'll show you guys the changes that will be made today in the cupboard here. We currently have a temporary solution here for the network run, which is port number two here on the incoming. So you can see this purple cable goes into the power line adapter. This power line adapter will be going because we don't need power line for anything in the home anymore. And we'll be taking a cable. I've got another one of these, so they'll all match, which is quite nice because this one is sticking out at the moment. We'll get this drop and we'll patch it straight into here. This port here, this one is the access point on the other side of the wall. This one is the TV line. And if you guys remember in the last part, we actually ran the TV line out of here ready. It's running all the way down the stairs there and I've got it coiled up in a heap at the bottom. So what we need to basically do, the most difficult part about today is going to be running the TV line along the hallway floor alongside the WAN feed then along the front of the door, and then through this wall here. Now there's already a hole here, and I can't take credit for this idea. When I was explaining about my difficulties about running this network drop in the previous part, a couple of people in the comment section actually suggested I do this method, and it's a really good idea that I hadn't thought of. The old telephone master socket was actually in here, and it was um, there was a hole drilled through the wall, and the hole is still there, and that was how the telephone feed from outside that's by the front door was coming into this room. That hole is still there, so I'm going to use it. And I'll run Cat6 through it, and that'll be the drop for the TV. So, essentially, we're running an extra bit of cable, which is already in place. We just have to finish the run and then terminate it. So, first of all, guys, what I'm going to do is pop a jack on the end of this line that's already here. And that way we can test my socket because I haven't actually tested this socket that we fitted a few months ago yet. And um, 
It's going to be a little bit awkward trying to get this out because of all the cabling behind the TV, but once we do, we can eliminate this longer cable, use this short one, and this is still a good length to be able to pull the cabinet away from the wall. So, I don't even need to take the gas box apart for this, I can just pull the cable out and we can terminate the end. In fact, let's see if I can fish it out right now. There are actually two cables in here, but it feels like I've grabbed the right one, and yes I have. So this is the one that we're putting a connector on right now. So let's go for it. Okay, so we've got one end done. And basically what I'm gonna do now, because I've forgotten which port is which, so I've pulled the stand out ever so slightly here, and I can now get to both of these porch, porch, <laughs> ports. Now I've got a hunch that it's gonna be the left hand one because if I was installing it today, then that's what I would make the network one. But let's have a little look. And let's pray that when I was doing this, I punched this down properly, because this is going to be a pain to get to. Ah, that is not the left one. Okay. Sorry for the dust, by the way, everyone. I'm very, very sorry. Just try not to look at it and think about it. Okay. Port number two. Whoa, what is going on there? That is wacky. Something wacky, wacky, wacky is going on there, folks. Looks like one of these ends isn't following the correct pin out here. And that's the first time that that has happened to me in this series of videos. One, two, three. Why are you so erratic then? Okay, what I'll do is I'll start by redoing the connector on this end, and then we'll see how far that gets us. Um, let me first try just a different ethernet cable, just for curiosity. Let's just try one of these patch cables before we go chopping anything up. So it's the same with this orange patch cable. I was, you know, obviously 99% sure it was going to be, but it was worth trying just before I chopped this connector off. Now, it's highly likely I've done this backwards. Tiredness might have kicked in and I've done this completely backwards. Let's just double check that. Annoyingly, my pinout on the RJ45 is looking perfect. So, this leads me to believe that I went somewhere wrong with installing that faceplate, which... I said earlier, I hope I did it right when I was doing it, because it's going to be a complete pain in the ass to get to. Um, but it looks like I've done something wrong with that guy. So I don't quite know what. What I'll do first, I'll try a diff I'll, I'll rewire this jack again, just in case, because that's only going to take me about two or three minutes. Whereas pulling this out, getting the hoover out to get rid of all that dust, because you can't really work back there with all that and uh, pulling that socket faceplate off and tracing the issue there and re-punching down the faceplate is going to take much longer. So um, let's redo this connector. So that's the jack rewired once again, equally as successfully. I think I've just gone a little bit balmy when I was fitting this stuff because I was trying to rush, sort of, when I was doing it. Let's have a look. No, look, it's Dool Alley again. So what I've done is I've reversed it. So all eight, all eight wires are connected, which is good, but it's just reversed somewhere. So I'm thinking, did I follow? Because, you know, on the back of the um, faceplate, they've got the other configuration. Like, I'm following. I always have this bit of paper handy because I don't have the kind of brain that retains this information. This is the B standard. I always have this bit of paper handy in my little network toolkit here. So everything I do here at work, wherever, is always this standard unless I know for a fact that it is something different on the other side. Um, but was I following the um, A standard? 
on that faceplate. However, I don't, I've never done that before accidentally, so I don't know how it looks on the meter. I know there's only a couple of things different on the A standard, so I'm not sure it would look quite this balmy on the meter here. All right, guys, I'm not gonna try and get back there with the camera because it is filthy and you can see it better on my phone anyway. Here's the wiring that I actually did. Hang on a sec, let me get to somewhere where there's more room to show you, because it's quite stressful. Okay, so the wiring itself looks acceptable, which is fine. And when I took this photo, I couldn't see what the diagram was referring to, because it's obviously blocked by the cable here. But I took another photo, and as you can see, I followed a, you can just about make out in the top corner here, you can just about make out that B, and it should be the green pair at the top here. Well, the orange pair is at the top, so I followed the A standard. This is really annoying because it's carelessness on my part. I should have triple checked because it now means that some of my network is in one config and some of it is in the other. I think what I'm gonna do, instead of fiddling with a socket, because it's a pain in the ass, I'll just wire this for the other standard and just live with it. And then when I do the projector, because I've done them both the same on this faceplate, I'll do that the same as well. So yeah, bit of a bummer. But if this was, say like um, something commercial, you know, in a public building or whatever, where you know other people would be working on the network, I'd have to change it obviously. But because it's my home, then I know my own mistake. And once both of these ends are terminated and in use, it's gonna be very unlikely that you're gonna alter either end. Plus when it doesn't work again next time, even if I don't remember that it's the different standard, then I'll just wire it for the other standard anyway, just like we've discovered today. So yeah, pain in the ass, guys. And that's what you get for rushing. And that's what you get for doing stuff late and cramming too much in in one evening. Today is not one of those days. It's quite early on in the evening and I haven't done very much. So I've got plenty of energy. So because of that, we can rectify this and we can get things moving along as we originally planned. So I'm gonna rewire this and then we're gonna see if we can get it up and running. Just looking at these LEDs closely here again, four out of the eight line up, four out of the eight don't. So if I've got one pair backwards, like I've got the green and the orange in the wrong place, that is four wires, so two pairs that are incorrect. So in theory, as soon as I rewire this connector, we should be golden and what my other wiring looks okay. So we're wired in the reverse standard. If this doesn't work, I'm stumped. Okay, that's a much more pleasing result, but where the heck is line three? So we're now on the correct standard. But we're missing number three. Let's presume it's the connector and try again and hope it's not the faceplate. Okay, so pin three, I know why pin three went down the drain last time. It's because it's the one that crosses over. So it's the orange white that's the one that, if any, is gonna catch you out because it's got a loop underneath the blue pair. And it's so strange, going from one standard that you've done loads of connectors on to a different standard, it's really disorientating. But this time, I, we should be good to go. I'm 100% confident. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There we go, let's just slow it down. Just check we're not seeing anything. Awesome, that is magnificent guys. So we've got a network connection. Now then, judging by what I did last time I stayed up late to do this kind of work, what I'm gonna do for today is get this feed that is coming out of there, feeding that socket. We're gonna plug it into the power line adapter right here. Yeah, I am tired, folks, I am tired. So plug that in there. Come on. 
There you go. So that's in. That has given us network to that socket. And what I'll do is I'll fish through and try and get this, which is coming out of the socket, into that switch. And of course, in turn, pull out this longer cable from the switch. So let's see if I can do that, and then the TV will have network. So we've got a link light on the power line adapter. That network cable is plugged in, so you guys can follow that along. We're now using the socket, and we have perfect network connection to the TV. So we still haven't eliminated the power line adapter, but I am getting tired. So I'm not going to do any more today, because the next step now would be to empty some of the stuff from the cupboard and actually drill through the staircase in a similar way that we drilled through for the WAN feed. So I don't have the energy to do that. This looks messy, but it is actually neat. Although there is more things in here than I remember from yesterday, but I have to feed that cable through the bottom and I'm not gonna do that tonight. We'll do that tomorrow night. So what I have done is got rid of this big cable and we are now that much closer to preparing for that connection. But the only bummer is that I thought was gonna be a five minute job, plonk an end on and plug it in. But that's where the surprises can come. So yeah, we're gonna call it a day for today and uh, we'll pick this up tomorrow or some other, e some other evening where I get time to do it. And then we should be on the home stretch then. So I've popped off the top of the gas box and over here, you guys can see down here by this um, carrot and uh, what's this? What's that? Orange, I think. Something else. There's all sorts of crap down here, Jess. Oh, chicken, roast chicken. Lovely. <laughs> you guys can see that that hole down there, let's see if I can feel where it is. I can't even, where the heck has it gone? I actually can't feel it at the moment, guys, but somewhere down there, there is a hole. And that hole is down through the wall. And basically the reason why it's there is because this was the master socket that the previous owners of the home were using. And I didn't even know it was here. When, when I moved in, there was a BT junction box on the wall down by the front door. It's actually still there, we'll see it in a minute. And I knew there was a cable coming from that into this room. I didn't even bother looking for this because I couldn't see it at first glance. So I just put my own master socket down by the front door, um, which you're not really meant to do anyway, but we covered all that in the part, part one of the network series, I think. Um, so go back and watch it if you haven't seen it. This really thin, nasty little telephone cable here is feeding this socket. And basically, it was so thin, this cable was going below the floor. Now we're not gonna be able to run Cat6 below the floor in the hallway. It's a wooden floor. It's laid absolutely terribly, and it's too high as well. But that does work to our advantage for running these cables around the edge of it, because there's a good gap between the floor and the wall. Um, we'll have a look at everything in a second, but this is where we're going to be working today, getting the... This is the destination to get the cable then. So we've got the RJ45 on the end of this run. We need to get another RJ45 on the end of the other run, and that's the run that we need to get from the cupboard. So, this is our destination. Okay, so these are the two lines coming down the stairs. One's the WAN feed, that's been there for a long time, and it's been set up and working fantastically. Um, this is the second line that we ran in the previous video, showed it in the previous clip also. All I'm going to do right now is complete the tack of the line along the bottom of the stairs there, and it's going to reach that corner destination. Then I'll feel where the existing hole is drilled. I'll feel the clearance around the hole to see whether it's best if we drill the new hole above, below, um, to the side, because I can't quite remember where the hole is positioned in relation to the clearance of that particular area. So we'll do that and then we'll be able to pull the cable through. Just like last time, we'll leave some slack in the cupboard here, but we'll also leave some a tiny bit of slack in the gas box. But the majority of the slack that's going to end up uh, accumulating, we will leave in the cupboard here because it's much safer.
And as you can see, where did I store it? Uh, it's actually hard to see. I basically rolled up the WAN cable and left a load of slack for that down here as well. Because obviously the modem is by the front door, length was no longer a concern for the WAN feed which is really cool and that's one reason why we got the modem as close to the Marcus master socket as physically possible. So I'm going to tack this along here right now, it'll, it'll look a lot tidier once I've done that and then we'll just be left with a big cable. I'll find the end, job done, pull her through and uh, we should be getting closer and closer to our destination there in the gas box. So I've managed to sort of tack that along there, it's very difficult because you've got to lay on your stomach to reach and then stretch your arms out and try and hammer with your arms out flat. In hindsight, what I should have done is run the cables down to this point where I'm kneeling right here and tack them just across here. It, they didn't necessarily have to be tacked across the bottom there, but at least they're completely out of the way. Got a little bit of a loop there. I need to pop another one in there, um, but turns out what I did, there was a gap underneath this floor. I'd forgotten all about this. There's a gap underneath this laminate, so I drilled the hole and then I crammed all the slack underneath the laminate, which is great. Um, and there's also a little bit of slack coiled up alongside the staircase there. So we'll do the exact same with this. Best place to drill the hole is above the existing hole. We'll do it from the other side, because that's the easiest. We'll just peel back the carpet, do that. And I'll show you that process, of course. Tidy up a tiny bit more in here, then get rid of any potential knotting in here before we start putting the cable through the hole. So I've pulled all this cable out over here. We've got more than enough length to reach that gas box location, hopefully. It was a complete and utter guess, like all of this cabling was when I did it. So I'm um, just gonna bung another one in there. Not gonna bother with that last one, to be perfectly honest, folks. It's all the way over there and I can't reach, and this is absolutely fine. No one is ever gonna see this. Basically, storage-wise, all we put down here, uh, what did I pull out of here? Uh, some painting things, um, some painting supplies, like rollers and uh, some old carrier bags and stuff like that and dust sheets and whatnot so it's all just stuff that's under here that never gets really used so it's absolutely fine of course this is my legendary beaded seat cover that i need to install in the new car because we've recently ish bought a new car for those of you who haven't seen my hallway in a while basically what i did was i ripped off all the wallpaper and ripped out all the skirting board that was along the bottom here and i've painted it white i painted all the rough looking walls just white um and this is in desperate need of redecoration. I've probably said this word at least 8 million times in the video, but this is temporary. So, this is the modem, and it may, may be in a different location to where it was when you last saw it. We've got our master socket here. It has been changed. Um, I think I've spoken about this master socket in a previous part, but honestly, I have lost track. I'm gonna be ordering another one of these to keep it in stock because they do break. And in fact, this one physically is broken, but also the micro filters in them break as well. They're just not good master sockets with the toolless design. Um, we've got our open reach modem, still works absolutely wonderfully. This is the BT junction box I was telling you guys about. So that's gonna come off the wall. Now basically, all of this looks completely rough and horrible, as you can see, as well as the entire hallway. I can fit my entire small finger in the gap there with the floor. And you guys can see here, a little bit uneven, but you know, um, this is where we're going to be running our cable. And there's the hole through to the gas box. So we're coming, basically, we are coming out here. I've already peeled the carpet back. You can see the existing cable. We're going to drill above it, bring another cable along here. Plenty of room for it. Another cable along, another cable along. Round, 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 and through. Now, eventually, the plan is when we tidy up all of this, do the redecoration, we'll get a nice box made, thin, low profile box, get the bottom half of all of this hidden, this will be hidden, this will be hidden, this, all of it, and all that will poke out is the front of the master socket and the top of the modem, and then we'll have um, a landline telephone for emergencies just on the wall here with a nice, sorry guys, camera battery. But as I was saying, can have a uh, landline telephone for emergencies, nice boxed in here, all looking neat and tidy. Um, we've lived with it like this for a long time now and it will be very nice to get it all sorted because it is a little rough in here and being the entrance to the home, 
it can feel a little disheartening sometimes. But it's better now that I've ripped all the wallpaper off because even though the walls are really rough and we've got big holes in the walls where things have been ripped off and whatnot, um, at least we don't have peeling wallpaper. We've pulled through from here, fresh hole drilled, and just roughly going straight through the wall now. We'll pop an end on. We'll get the slack that we want in the box, tie it up, put the lid on, uh, test it obviously, then we'll dress it back and we'll know exactly how much length we're left with under the stairs. Whew. Turns out I was kind of nervous because I knew that other cable was tiny. I was nervous we'd have to drill around here and of course it's really close to the gas. So really, really glad that this is such a massive hole. I knew it was massive on this side, but didn't know it was massive all the way through the wall. And if we take a look at the end, coming through, you guys can see that I was trying to find it. It's right there, right by the pipe. <laughs> That's not a gas pipe, it's a water pipe, but still, we don't want to be hitting that either. So I dug out one of these patch cables that I'm going to need to use in the cupboard to make it match the other ones. And I thought we may as well use it for the tester because then I can just patch straight in. So let's put the tester on and nip in the cupboard and see if it's working. I hope it is after the fiasco that was the other day. Hope I managed to do this one correctly. Yes, that's the same type of cable. Sorry guys, not filming appropriately there. Look at that. Lovely. It was just an off day the other day. Just an off day. So, I'm just going to kill that tester. Don't want to send that back into the switch. Here you go. And what we'll do, guys, live on camera, quite ceremoniously, is retire the power line adapter. So, what have we got here? There's that slightly longer purple, purple cable, slightly different purple. Let's kill that out of there. Let's borrow our tester, just bung that in my pocket. Apologies for the filming here, folks. This feels so good to finally have this the way that it's meant to be. Oh, would you look at that? That is annoying. We've got, we, want, we don't want them to cross over. Huh. Tell you what doesn't actually make a difference. Unmanaged switch really does not make a difference. If we swap the access point to there and we pop the TV in there, it just keeps it neater. So this was the original diagram. It is now laid out perfectly. The only thing left to do is remove the power line adapter and plug the UPS directly into the socket. Okay, so power line adapter's gone. That is in. There we have it. We are set in here, finally. This is the finalized plan, completely 100% done. We've now retired this guy. So, let's make the link. Of course, now we can pull out, we can pull this out. Oh, come on. go. So now what we have, dinosaurs, flipping egg. Okay. <laughs> so we've got these two connectors. One is coming from the socket behind the TV and the other from the cupboard. So now we just need our keystone to tie them together. We successfully have perfect network without power line, which is definitely, definitely something I've been waiting to do for a long time. So if you guys remember when we moved in, between that shelving unit I had here, that sort of AV rack with my turntable and stuff on it, and all the other junk going on, we've gone from that and the humongous bundle of rat's nest cabling for various things and they've now all gone. The only cable left in sight here is the power cable for the lamp. And you know, the lamp is absolutely trashed, so we'll be getting a new one soon anyway. So the gas box lid is back on, and as ugly as it is, 
at least all of the network cabling is now hidden. I made a nice little bundle next to the old phone socket there. I also trimmed the uh, wiring that was coming from that because it was just sticking out for no reason. And I've tidied up the hallway. So here we've got a temporary, obviously there'll be a new skirting board being fitted here. But here we have the temporary solution to stop the cable from being yanked. So we've got the cable nicely secured to the wall here. And it runs along the front of the floorboards. And yeah, it looks a bit wavy. But this is kind of like a, a gap, like no man's land really. I'd assume that when we do the decoration here, we'd be addressing the end of this floor because it's so bad. I'd, I would assume that something would be going here to, you know, bridge the gap between the floor and the door. And then that would leave this nice void here. Um, got a bit of a curl around here, but again, we're really zoomed in. You know, if you step back, it's no big deal. And then we're just running along with the other one. Now these little nails, whatever they are, Old cable clip by the looks of it, there was a cable clipped along here before. Um, yeah, these are old cable clips, I've just realised that. And I didn't put these in. Or did I? Hang on a sec. Wait, are they left over from when I ran that, um, that original Cat6 cable up to my office? Up the stairs? They may well be left over from that, but I, I don't think I... I don't think I used them. Anyway, uh, you can see the cable is running along there. Now, because we've got two cables, it's not perfect. You can pull it away from the wall. So what I'll probably end up doing is a couple of tacks along here. But the kids are trying to get to sleep, so I don't want to go hammering right now. I'll do that tomorrow. And again, this will be hidden soon. When I say soon, God knows when, but whenever we redecorate the hallway, and then of course, neat as you like on the corner here, carpet curls ever so slightly, but that's no big deal. You can see we've got two runs in there. Could always trim a little bit of this excess carpet in the back here to make the front piece of carpet sit nicer. But if you push it enough, you get a relatively flat bit of carpet there. Oh, I've just noticed that, look. Look at that. Isn't that odd? I've never noticed that before. One quick note I forgot to mention, folks, is it's covered by the doormat. The doormat stays permanently here, butted up against the door, so there's no chance of getting your foot caught in the cable or anything ridiculous like that. If that was the case, then that would be rubbish. That would be a rubbish, rubbish installation. It's not the greatest in the world as it is. Um, if I was a 100%, you know, competent kind of um, handyman or whatever, I could have dropped it down the wall. I could have chased it in the wall from upstairs. Pulled up the floor, you know, done that, but that's just, that's just way beyond me at the moment. I think we'll just have to make do with this. But yeah, the cupboard was a good plan. It all came together and uh, it's working. So that's the main thing. Now, let's talk about what we're gonna do in this little portion. I've got some more toys over here, but before we look at those, if you guys saw my video that I did on adding some underglow to the Powerhack G4, you guys will know that I now have a additional spare. Let's see if we can get it fired up here, folks. Ah, yes, here we go. It is on. I couldn't tell because it's so bright. I have just temporarily plopped this here. I was thinking of adding some lighting to the cabinet anyway, but... We've got this spare RGB strip now. This is the butchered one that's got all of the RGB colors forcefully enabled. Um, so you can't control color with it, but it's very handy for lighting up the rack. So we'll get this little controller in place. We'll get all of that wired in and we'll have a lovely little strip there that we can turn on and off when we want to work on the rack and things like that. I'll just give it some nice subtle glow. So nothing glitzy, nothing, you know, disco-tastic. It's just here to give a little bit of work light and to make things look nice. So. That's what we're going to be doing in this portion as well. So we've got a little bit of extra work to do with the LED strip. As you can see, even in daylight, it does improve things quite a bit. So that's nice. So we've got that. And we're going to finish off the cooling system, obviously. Now, you saw the fan go in underneath the UPS. That's all, you know, 
well and good, but we're actually going to tie it all together. So we've got two more Noctua fans. We've got one for the top. This is exact, exactly the same fan that we unboxed previously in the video and uh, plopped in the bottom. So we're going to plop a fan in the top and we're going to plop a fan or at least attempt to plop a fan halfway up the rack. Now this is where I really struggled guys. You can buy 19 inch rack panels with pre-drilled 120 mil fan cutouts. I'll put a picture on the screen, you can get them in one fan, two fan, three fans, you can get three fans across a 19 inch um, panel, 320 mil fans, and they're, they're cheap as chips, little, um, they're just blanking plates with holes cut in them essentially. So I could have gone for one of those, but what I didn't want, I didn't want to blow the air vertically. So we've got air coming in through the bottom, it's coming through the filtered intake at the bottom, it's meant to go past all the equipment, giving a little bit of cooling, cooling the cabinet overall. If you think of the entire server rack when the door is closed, think of it like a PC case. You've got multiple components contributing to heat and then you've got the overall cooling in the case that is intaking the fresh air, cooling, then exhausting the hot air. So what I wanted to do, I wanted to facilitate that process by adding a fan in the middle portion of the rack to add to that pressure to carry some of the air right through to the top of the rack. So adding a vertical panel at either the front or the back wouldn't have been effective. It would have just blown air all over the place. It would have got things circulating, but it would kind of be impossible for me to tell whether that is effective or not, because you're getting into obviously complex science in terms of airflow and pressure and static stuff and whatnot. So plonking a fan could have been useful vertically, but I think that probably not is the answer to that. What I wanted to do is get it horizontal. This one will be horizontal, this one is horizontal. Getting it lined up the same so that you're facilitating that carrying of the air. What they don't appear to make is any kind of rack bracket that allows you to get a 19 inch um, mount with a flat 120 millimeter fan mount. Now you can get various fan accessories for racks that provide like a tray of fans that blow upwards and are designed to blow against the bottom of a piece of equipment or whatever. Absolutely fine. I didn't want anything like that because they're huge, they're loud, they use like 240 volt fans, they spin like mad, they're really loud. Um, I just wanted something tiny that I could mount another PC fan to just to facilitate things. So what I decided to do guys, I could have bought one of those other fan mounts, modded it, um, tried to attach it to a normal blanking plate and blanking plate and stuff like that but what I decided to do is buy something really simple and kill two birds with one stone. I bought this very shallow depth, this is the most shallow depth shelf I could find. Uh, one new rack shelf and what we're going to do, we're going to drill a couple of holes in the shelf at the back here and we're going to mount the fan with two screws here at the back of the shelf and it's just going to hang off the edge. It's going to be a bit janky um, but it's going to be in the server rack. Nobody is going to be touching it. It's not going to be visible, so it would be absolutely fine. One thing I did forget to order, I was going to get a grill for the fan, one of those metal grills. Um, I forgot to order it. If I order it now, it'll delay this whole process by another three or four days, so I'm not going to go for that, but it'll be easy enough to add in the future anyway. The only real benefit that'll give me is if I do happen to stick my hand back there, I won't get my fingers chopped off. Um, Obviously, these fans aren't strong enough to chop your fingers off, but I mean, it really does hurt if you happen to catch one. They're running at full speed as well. Um, so there's that to consider. And of course, if a cable accidentally dangles down into the fan, then it won't like shred up the cable and stuff, or at least get all tangled up and whatnot. So um, we're going to do that. We're going to make our own little DIY mount. But as I say, it kills two birds with one stone because we've got a standard transformer here. We can mount this transformer to the rack shelf with some cable ties here through these ventilation holes. And this will be a proper mount for our PSU. We've got a few bits and bobs paraphernalia wise that we're gonna to need to attach. So I've got a transformer here. Uh, I just picked up a, let's have a look at the spec of this one. Yes, so this is a six amp power supply. I over it ever so slightly just in case I wanted to add anything else in the future. This will by far have enough output for three fans. So this is just a standard 12 volt um, six amp 
power supply here, so that's great. That'll just mount there, we'll attach it to the PDU. And then for the other side, what I decided to do, folks, was uh, my little box of tricks here. So this is a three-way fan splitter, and we've got, let's have a look. There you go. We've got our three fan connectors on the end. On the other end was a Molex connector. So all I did was I yanked off the Molex connector. So you can see this has given us our bare wires here because I physically just grabbed the connector and pulled it off. And what we've got here is one of these little barrel connectors. So I'll use the female end of this. Uh, yes, like this. It'll go into the power supply. Sorry about this sort of not very good presentation guys and this will give me a little screw terminal to attach those cables to so we'll have the power supply going straight to the fan splitter we'll tie this all back we'll mount it all on the shelf here we'll build it up outside of the rack so that we can just plop it in we'll also test it with these two fans outside to make sure everything's working so that is the electrical side of things um, you can get off the shelf uh, Molex power supplies and things like that. So you basically get your transformer, your your um, your brick here, your power supply, and you can get a Molex on the other end. You can get those, you can buy them, but they're overly expensive. You know, these power supplies are a couple of quid, and you've probably got one lying around anyway. The only reason I didn't use one that I had lying around was I always get nervous that they're for something because all of my stuff is so disorganised. I know that every power supply I've got, in theory, is meant to go along with something else. So when it comes to me sorting out my stuff and selling it and looking for power supplies, I don't want to have butchered a power supply for something to use for a project. So these are just a few quid, I picked one up. That's not a problem at all. Um, so yes, that's what we're gonna do. A Little bit, you know, thrown together, but it'll work just fine. It'll be perfectly safe. And then for the final little thing that we're gonna look at, um, this is interesting. We'll go over to the web page here for the rack. Now. This is the um, Z-Pass SJB rack uh, cabinet website here. Now you can see that my rack is currently in this state with the desktop just plonked on top. But this is what we want. We want it risen up ever so slightly because what that allows us to do is get the air gap on the exhaust. But that's not a problem. They sell a kit. It's basically four screws, four washers and four spacers. They talk about the kit here, there's the order number, but it is impossible to get any contact with Z-Pass from the UK at the moment, it seems. I've sent them multiple emails and I've had no response and I'm not the only one. Um, and also all of their products, they used to have tons of rack bundles at such good deals. These racks, guys, these racks were such a good deal, under 200 quid for this, delivered way under 200 quid. You, you could catch them on sale all the time on eBay, Amazon, it was fantastic. Had all bundles with uh, wheels and shelves and PDUs and thermostats and fans and mounting hardware and all sorts of different things. All of that is gone. All of these racks from eBay in the UK are completely gone. Um, so whether they're not dealing here anymore or whether it's to do with the pandemic or whatever, I just have no clue. But anyway, you can't get in touch with these guys. So. I knew I wasn't gonna get a hold of the official desktop elevation kit, but that wasn't a problem anyway because they have nicely detailed all the specs of everything here. Now it states that these screws, this is the only spec that I really needed, M6 30 millimeter screws. So I ordered some M6 30 mil screws and lo and behold, they don't fit. So here they are, here's the ones I ordered. They're too fat. So. Whether my rack was drilled differently, or it was an earlier one or a later one, I don't know. Whether they have it listed wrong on the website, I don't know. But for any of you with an SJB rack, if you're looking to elevate the desktop and you can't get a hold of the official desktop elevation kit, and you want to buy this stuff on your own, you need to buy M5 screws, 30mm M5. They're the ones that'll fit. Then we've got these spacers. These are really easy to come by. I think these are 20 mil maybe. Let's see if that works out. Uh, yeah, it kind of does roughly. Yeah, 20 mil, it's about two thirds the size of the screw. So you'll get that much height elevation out of the rack. We're gonna fit these today. I did order washers as well. Washers have not come, which is annoying because I was gonna use them for both the fan mount and the rack. 
but some deliveries are a little sketchy at the moment. So we're going to try and rock all of this without washers. It would be nice, but we don't have any, and all the ones I've got are for much bigger things. So yeah, no washers, but we will uh, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. So I thought I'd put you guys on the camera for a little bit of excitement um, while we test this out. So let's dig out one of our Noctua fans. And I'm thinking, guys, that rack gets so hot and I haven't attached one with the bottom fan. I'm just not going to use the low noise adapters because hopefully it'll be quiet enough in the rack anyway. And guys, I'm just always just... I can't believe how warm it gets in there during these summer days. It's very warm in the room, but still, it's absolutely shocking. So we want maximum cooling capability. Um, so let's connect one of these fans. We'll test one fan first of all. So just double checking everything here. Just plug in the power supply, give it a whirl with just the single fan. I've got a kettle lead down here. It's not very long, so let's jack that right in. There we have it. So the fan is spinning, folks, and shifting, shifting some air. Now these are still, oh crap, <laughs> caught my finger already. These are still really quiet, super quiet, even without the low noise adapters. So let's leave that one spinning there a second. Hopefully it's not making a windy sound through the microphone. That's why I've kept it that way. We will probably need the extension cable. And let's dig into the second fan. Again, we'll keep out our extension cable because we will most likely need it. Having said that, one fan will be mounted directly on this panel, so we won't need a lot of length for that. Pop that over there. So we've got a second fan here, folks. Let's just try it in one of these spare connectors. There we go. So that's two fans spinning successfully. And what we'll do is we'll just try the third connector. It will of course work, but we need to test everything before we get it in the rack. Correct orientation would help. And there you have it. There's the, there's the third connection working perfectly. So power supply is fired up little blue light there on the power supply to show that we are on, which is cool. Now there's gonna be no switch or anything, no control. Um, I'm not gonna need control over it. It's gonna to need to be on all the time because the way that my rack works at the moment is I've got the nice glass door on the front, but I can never close it because as soon as I close it, the temperature on that Synology rack station and the Mac Mini just goes whoosh, through the roof and the fans start going crazy on both of those devices and I have to open the glass door again. Now I'm surprised I haven't smashed the glass door yet because the amount of times I've crashed into it or bumped something into it in the room is crazy. So I'm hoping with the additional rack cooling that these three fans, the one in there and the two here, hoping the additional cooling that they will provide will be enough for me to be able to close the glass door. So that is the power sorted for the fans. Now we're going to put all of this to one side for a second except for one fan. So let's move all of this. Now what I'm aiming for here folks is a mount that is going to be successful on the shelf here and I think the way that I'm going to do that is simply by drilling two holes on the shelf and mounting the fan like that and then that will push air up through the rack. One side isn't going to be secured to anything but I think that is my best bet. Yes. Let's just do that. We can't do it right on the edge because even though it would give us more airflow in theory, because if we do it there, we're gonna have quite a bit of the fan blocked by the shelf there. But if I do it over here, guys, if I do it to one side, like that, we'll have some additional air holes. 
Okay, that is what we're going to do. And then, that's going to sit there, and we will have plenty of room for our power supply that can be tied here, and all of the cabling nest can be tied up neatly in the bundle here next to the fan. And we'll still have enough clearance for the IEC connector to go in there. Oof. Okay, so we've got one little hole drilled. We're going to go up a bit size, drill it out a bit bigger so we can get our fan screw through. with a nice fan screw. I'm just working my way up here folks in bit sizes because I don't want to make the hole too big accidentally because I don't have any washers as well. I want the hole to be quite tight around the screw. Okay, so onto the second hole. There we go. So we should be laughing with that second mount. There we go. So, perfect guys. We are looking perfect. And with two actual screws in versus the low, low noise adapter, low noise adapters, the, um, oh God, rubber fan mounts. With two screws in, it's completely solid. As you can see, I've got this whole shelf just by the fan itself, so it's not going anywhere, there's no wobble. And you've still got that level of rubber isolation because you've got the rubber pads on the corner here of the fan. So that should still be relatively quiet and what we'll do, we'll plug in the power supply and test that theory right now. So let's get the power supply hooked up. Making this mess has reminded me once again, folks, that I need to purchase some kind of small office vacuum cleaner or whatever, or at least a brush or something. Um, for stuff like this. I was thinking the other day I made a similar mess over on my main desk and then it was just a palaver to try and get the dust back under control. So definitely need one of those little handheld hoovers. The only hoover that we've got is the big Henry. So it's a lot of effort to uh, drag him up just to clear up a small amount of mess like this. Anyway, let's get the power supply mounting. I did get these cable ties a minute ago, but they are deceivingly short for this purpose. So we're gonna use three here, not take any chances of slippage. We're gonna secure it nice and tightly to the shelf. Gonna pop it there, that gives us enough clearance this side for the IEC plug. Okay. Just loose to begin with until I get everything aligned. There we have it, nice and secure, and we've got our even buckles here. Yeah, looking good, need my snips. There we go. So, that's the power supply on the tray. Now the next thing is to give some attention to the cabling, because we can keep it all quite nicely contained. Just have to double check that fan is in the correct orientation as well. It's blowing upwards. The shelf is going to be mounted like that with everything on show. So upwards is correct. Could have done it upside down, I suppose. Face the fan the other way and then that might have looked a bit cleaner in the case. But then at least this way you can see the power supply, you can see the connectors and you can access it easily. So we'll stick with the original plan. So what I'm going to do guys is I'm going to leave two of the three fan connections quite loose because we may need the additional length but I'm going to get them quite up close to this side here because that way we can run them neatly up the rack and we don't have wires crossing all over the place. So we're going to aim for this sat here alongside the fan This connected like so. Don't want any unnecessary strain, so if we can get that looped around that way, there we go, that would be the best. Just like that. We'll secure that. 
We'll secure that there right now actually because that is perfect. Good. So that is one sorted. Then what we'll do, because this barrel connector is quite loose guys, I'm going to get some electrical tape and we'll just secure that with tape for the simple reason that we don't want that coming loose. Now it's tied there and if I tie it here there's going to be no strain on the connector but still we don't want anything going amiss here. Also I could do with redoing that possibly. Let's have a little look. These wires aren't going anywhere. That's absolutely fine. That's secure. So we'll get this and we'll pop some electrical tape around the join. And that way we won't have to worry about that getting pulled out for any reason because you never know. And it's not like this is the only point that we can kill power to the fan supply. If we need to quickly kill power, we can easily do that by yanking the IEC, which of course would be the easier option anyway. Let's get my snips in there. Oh, look, I got scissors out just for that reason. Still, that's good. So that's a secure connection. That will be fine. What we need to do is tie that down and then make a bend here in the original adapter and tie that down as well so that we've got everything laid out quite nicely there. So let's tie this one down. Okay, fantastic. And now we've got just, it naturally wants to pull this way. So we'll secure the three remaining cables here right there and then we'll focus on connecting the fan that's on the board right on the panel here. So the cables are naturally moving that way which is nice we don't want any unnecessary strain on the connection here so we'll tie down the cables for strain relief just beside the fan here. This is another reason why I went for this shelf because it had so many vent holes I knew it would be great for tying stuff down. So we'll get this laying down here and we'll push it ever so slightly before we tighten it that way we're not making the situations worse there's a difference between strain relief and yanking connectors out by tightening zippers down too much so there we go that's perfectly fine that's adequate there's a little bit of bare wire showing there on the on the ground wire it's not an issue it can't touch anything it's not a problem it's just it was a longer strip than it can fit in this terminal here. So that's okay. And now what we'll do is focus on connecting the fan that's on the panel here. And to do that, we'll just loop one of these back whichever one is closest. So we've got this one here, we'll loop back alongside the fan, plug it in, and we'll see how secure this connection becomes now. We'll tape this connection also. I'm going to tape all of them, all of the fan connections in the rack, because they are the sort of connections that wiggle loose. And this is a permanent thing. So we may as well just add that extra level of security. Makes it look a bit jankier, but this is all about functionality. If I had black tape, it would look nicer. This is literally the only color I can find. Okay. Lovely. So now we just have this excess loop and we'll work on tying that down right here. What we'll do, we'll use a twist tie to create that bundle first. It nearly works out perfectly apart from that loop on the wire there. But that's okay, we can force that into place like that. So if we twist tie this bundle 
that is nice like that as you can see definitely more under control so now we'll just tie it down uh, we've got anything a bit thinner so there we have it that in fact guys I'm gonna redo that one I am not happy with that that is too tight that's sucking the life out of those cables that's one thing sometimes about using zip ties that are slightly too big you have a tendency to be a little bit over, over enthusiastic with the tightening shame I haven't got any dirty ones hang on a sec let's see what I've got I'm use one of these it's the only color I have it's definitely something I need to restock I'm in CHQ is low on consumables so cable ties oh no my twist tie popped loose I must have cut it too short that's a bummer. We had a perfect little connection there for a second, guys. Perfect little uh, organisation. There we go. That is more like it. Now we've got the odd one out yellow cable tie as well, which is rather fetching. Okay, so there we have it complete. My little fan board and its zone of power here. Let's just test it one more time, make sure it's working. Here we go. We've got air successfully spinning up. And of course, whoops, don't want to dangle that in the fan blades. Of course we have additional connectors for the rest of the fans in the rack. So this was a good move today. I've now run out of time to tinker with this up here. Um, but it works out well anyway because this is a new power supply and it's just a random online purchase of mine. Um, I'm going to leave it running with these fans so that it soaks in and if it's going to blow up or anything it'll do it outside of the rack. So <laughs> I'm going to let this run and then tomorrow we will put this lot in the rack. When you come away from these fans you realise just how much air they do push. The two of them there and it's creating a nice sort of field of airflow here. So I really do think we'll see some improvements in the cab. I hope so anyway. Um, yeah, so back again tomorrow with the installation of this, the completion of the LEDs and the finishing touches. Okay guys, I've got a little sort of 40 minute time slot here to do something today. So what I'm kind of hoping is um, to get this desktop elevated. So that would be actually really cool if we can do it, if I can try and do it without pulling the rack out as well. Just all depends if I can reach those screws in the back to get the desktop off. I don't think I'm gonna be able to do it because it becomes a much bigger task um, to pull the rack out because I've got to shut all the machines down. I don't like moving the rack with the hard drive spinning and then got to take the back panel off. So it just becomes a little more complex. If we can whip this out with the rack in place, that would be great. So I'm gonna move this stuff off the top and we're gonna give it a whirl. Hopefully we've got enough cable on here to just, oh, would you look at that? Ideal, that's perfect. Okay, let's do it. So I think if I take out this blanking panel, I think I'll be able to get my arm up through all the equipment and do it like that. see yes I can reach it perfectly folks I can reach it absolutely perfectly and in fact I can unscrew them straight away that's actually easier than I thought it was going to be which is cool very very short screws for the um, standard mounting of the top You guys can see the cable management hole that we'll eventually be using so that'll be great we can actually start we can actually transfer the cables to this now 
we may as well because then they'll all come out the top um, but we should have enough space to do all of that with the top in place because the spaces are quite big so these will sit there like that a top will raise and we'll be laughing so sorry if it seems like I'm rushing guys I want to get this done today so may seem sort of rushy but the main thing is we get it done because we are quite far into this now as you guys know so we'll mount the fan like this and we'll do it with the cable facing that way because that is the the closest it's going to be to the connection on this rack panel at the back and we'll need these four rubber mounts wasn't easy, got a little bit of uh, battle scarring there from the strain past the equipment but as you can see rubber mounts and the fan is in and just like the bottom one it impresses me because with these Noctua rubber mounts you feel like they're not going to work, you feel like they're not going to hold the fan at all and then as soon as you get all four in you've got support and it's fine, it holds. Nowhere near as strong as screws obviously but it holds just fine, but you have to have all four. It's not like screws, you can't just have two or three. They work only with all four in. And once they're in, they are in. So, oh crap, I've just messed that one up. See, don't go fiddling, don't go fiddling. I'm just fiddling, why am I doing that? So you can just give them all a little extra yank underneath, but you can see it's a complete, a complete rubber fit up there, so, Oh yes, lovely. That's excellent folks. Now what I'll do is work on passing some of these cables through the back instead of the, sorry, through the top instead of through the back. And that way we can start to free up these holes in the back. Because like I said earlier in the video, we're gonna start using just the bottom and just the top. Another mega success. We've got every single cable now running through the top instead of the back. So we're talking LAN, WAN and power for the router, power and data for the hard drive dock, power and USB for the printer and the ethernet feed for my main setup, the temporary one that we ran around the wall. So all coming through the top, now what we've got to do, and I've just about got enough time, just about got enough time to do it, is put the desktop on. So we're gonna do it without washers. We don't have washers, which is a shame because that would have finished it off nicely but we've got our 30 mil M5 screws, spacers, and where's the other spacer I was fiddling with? There it is. Awesome. So I'm gonna give this a whirl, putting the desktop back on. We have done it, complete success. The top is now risen. As you can see with these lovely spacers, they look classy, really classy. If you did it with just nuts and bolts or just screws going straight up, then it wouldn't look as classy. That is nice and of course gives you a real solid top. It's not going anywhere. You can see in there, you can just about make out the cables coming out the back. As you can see, loads of room for cables to come out the back there loads of space and they'll be easy to feed through because of course the beauty of this now folks is now that everything oh crap have I, how many times have i fallen over in this video <laughs> the beauty of this is with everything coming out the top and the bottom if you want to take the back off you just wheel the rack forward take the back off you can take the panel completely away it makes no difference because all of the cables will be coming out the top and the bottom so that's perfect all I've got left to do now is bung the printer and stuff on top and we'll take one final look and see how everything's looking. And we'll put this panel back on the front as well. So 
So I've put on the LEDs. I know they're not properly mounted yet. And it looks nasty that they light up all that mess in the back. Um, but just focusing on the top for a second, as you can see, absolutely perfect. Couldn't have asked for a better fit than that. It's great and it actually, obviously the main function is the airflow because this is a nice airflow gap that I can get. Look at the thickness of that, you know. This is a 20 mil spacer, so it's 20 mil there. Get a nice bit of airflow out of that top fan now. Should be able to feel it, to be honest. If the, ro if the rack is hot, you should be able to feel the air coming out. Yeah, really pleased with the outcome of that, guys. Really pleased. And um, as a note for the gear in the front, I'm not going to be shifting any of it around in this video, but the planning stages for the next network-related series where we'll be adding new equipment, the planning stages are still very wibbly-wobbly at the moment, so I'm not 100% sure whether we're going to have two pieces of gear here or three. I'm not quite sure. So, it may become reality that we move the patch panel up to the top. And to be honest, I'd quite like to do that anyway, because it'll block off the top nicely. And also, it's the easiest way to do things, because if you need to make a really quick change, pinch, you know, in the pinch of the moment, pinch of a moment, whatever the expression is, you've got space above, to, above the first, the first piece of equipment here, the patch panel. To do it you can do it much more easily um, without the patch panel buried underneath a piece of equipment and it'll just look a bit nicer I think so that's why I haven't gone ahead and purchased a load of patch leads I don't know the length that we're gonna need yet I really don't know it's all up in the air so all that will be revealed next time but what we have got to look forward to as the closing of this video comes closer and closer is the installation of this panel that we made yesterday great stuff that'll be going in the back somewhere around there probably just above that shelf and then we will be able to connect up all the cooling and test the rack cooling so this is it for this little session i will hopefully continue with this tomorrow so yesterday evening i was fiddling around with the led strips and I think what would look really cool is if we get this one at the top, but also sneak one down at the bottom as well. Now there's this handy lip on the rack here. We can hide the LED strips. So the, um, the LEDs themselves aren't visible when you look at the rack, unless you're literally looking right from the top. So what I've done is I've removed the strip from under the uh, Quicksilver because we're gonna get new ones for that anyway. And this was still under here from the video. So we've got that one strip up there. We'll pop another strip down here, and that will be perfect, as you can see, perfectly hidden, and it'll still, because there's such a good spread on these LEDs, it'll still shine some light up, because what I was finding at night time was all of this was like super bright, and then down here was just kind of nothing, so this will help with the glow coming up, and what I've done is I've dug out some of my other LED accessories so um, we've got a nice bit of cable here that will be able to run from the top to the bottom so that'll be absolutely fine. So I'm excited to see how easy it's going to be to move the rack because this will be my theory tested. Half of this work is to try and make things easier what with the cables coming out the bottom and coming out the top so as long as everything is clear I'm kind of hoping that the entire thing will just be able to slide out super easily for us to crack it open at the back. And that appears to be the case. Fantastic, guys. So not a single cable is going through the back panel anymore, meaning that we can easily take off the back and just angle it round. I remembered afterwards about that earthing cable, but that's not a problem, because all we do is as I say, angle it round. There's even enough length on this cable here, which is the temporary Ethernet cable for my PC, my main setup, I should say. My apologies if this clip appears a fair bit darker than the rest of the video, guys. Um, the weather has indeed taken a little bit of a turn, so there's less light in here in general. It's a bit tricky to get the lights behind here. Now, one odd thing about this rack I find. I may change them because it's a bit of an inconvenience. This back panel screws on with T25 torque screws, um, 
which is a bit odd. So I'm using Jess's screwdriver actually because she's got the best multi-bit screwdriver out of the pair of us. And uh, it is actually a great screwdriver kit for general purpose around the house use. There we have it. Yeah, I'm not crazy about the mounting system for the back panel guys. It's probably my only complaint about the rack. It's just because it's so difficult to align the screws because of how deep they've got to go in. Um, and it's, you know, then you end up dropping them and whatnot, but it's absolutely fine. You cannot grumble for the price. Okay, so, hope you can see this on camera, guys. This is the theory being tested. No cables in the back panel. Everything is still connected. The network is still active. The servers are shut down, yes, but the network is still active. So we just fold this round keeping the earth cable attached. We've found three of the screws and the other one is probably lurking inside here. Yes, I've got it. So no big deal there, folks. And we are in, we are ready to start fiddling about. So again, apologies for the light, guys. Um, it's gonna be hard to get decent light today, but I'm not gonna show you too much back here anyway, because we were back here so much. Um, oh wow, look at that, all of that was attached up there, wasn't it? That's looking a bit more messy than I left it. Um, yeah, I'm going to tidy up a lot of this. It's not going to be mega tidy, not going to be as tidy as I originally planned because I just don't know what equipment is going to be coming. So I can't tie things back too neatly and go too crazy because I might have to just move it anyway and that wouldn't be good. Um, but let's just have a quick look at this. I'm gonna move some of these cables out of the way and then we'll get the fan panel in and we'll fiddle with that for a bit. Okay guys, I'm probably gonna block a lot of the frame when I'm screwing this in, but I just wanna show you what I'm doing. So, let's grab the fan panel. I've temporarily tied some of the cables back out of the way, but I'm not happy with the way the cables have ended up back here, but I can't do anything about it at the moment. While I've been fiddling about here, I've been trying to think of a method to resolve this, but I simply can't do it, not until I get the new gear. So when I make the new series, you guys will see the recabling of the rack. It won't be a complete recable, because as you know, we've done a huge portion of it, but these little finicky cables up here and stuff will sort all that. Plus as well, when more things change, you know, presumably when I get a new printer at some point in the future and whatnot, every little step towards that will make a difference because we won't be fiddling around with little USB cables anymore and stuff like that. And one thing that's actually elimin eliminated a lot of that already is the ditching of those additional Firewire hard drives. So we now have much less Firewire cabling hanging around and much less thin um, transformer cabling, like, I uh, can't even find any, like this, it's hidden up here. So that transformer is there for the, for the one um, external drive that we've got in. We're gonna be adding, of course, a little bit more wiring with these LEDs and the fans, but the majority of the LED stuff will be contained at the front and to the sides of the rack and all of this fan stuff is contained on this shelf that we did a few days ago. So that's half the reason why we did this as well, to keep things neat. Now what I have done, guys, I don't know how much you can see, but I have prepared the two fans that were in the rack with extension cables. So what I'll do now is just grab the camera and show you guys what I've done. So starting off with the bottom fan, when I mounted it originally, I didn't know what side the fan power supply was gonna run. So we've got the fan cable coming out of this side in this direction, but that's not a problem. I've just attached one extension there. I've taped it on with my lovely yellow tape and we've attached another extension there so we can now comfortably get up to the shelf with plenty of room to manage the cable. Now the top fan is right there, so we would have reached without an extension, but to give us wiggle room and to give us management room, I've taped an extension onto it. So that's perfect. 
I should have really ordered one of those fan grills. I may in fact still order it because I'll be able to install that from the front. I'll be able to get my arms through and pop that on the top of the fan, might help things. Um, you know, obviously these cables aren't going to be here when we do the final cable management. There should be no cables at all. When I pictured this in my head, I did presume that the fan panel was going to be more sort of halfway up the rack. Ideally, it would be great to get it in between these two larger systems here. So that's something I could think about again in the future. All of these things will get will get talked about in future videos, folks, so that's not a problem. Um, and again, this one is purely to aid the flow of air up the rack. So I'm going to plug these fans in and then we're going to plug it into the mains and see how much noise it all makes. Okay, I'm excited. I've plugged all the fans in and I've got my kettle lead here. Now what we're going to be doing with the fan panel is even though there's an IEC power supply here, we could run it straight off the dedicated IEC PDU. What I'd rather do, uh, for safety reasons, is run it with its own dedicated 13 amp plug off the top PDU here. This plug has a 3 amp fuse in it, so I'd rather the fan system to be um, individually fused. So that's why we're going to run a dedicated power cable for it. You know, unlike a system like uh, the Synology or whatever that is plugged directly into the UPS. So as soon as we plug this kettle lead in to the power supply, we'll hear it all spin up. Okay, here we go. Let's do it. Holy cow! Guys, it's pretty loud. <laughs> Shite! <laughs> oh man! Okay, not to worry. We've got a few things to remember here. Firstly, this back panel will be off. Uh, on. God, I need some sleep. This back panel will be on, so that's great. And the front door will hopefully be closed, as long as these fans can adequately cool all the equipment while it's closed. Now, one huge gripe I have with the fan system that I've designed here is no air gets to the Mac Mini in between these two shelves. Um, it's not that great there, but there is flow through the case. Now that top fan is spinning. Ow. Yeah. And the bottom one. I can feel the airflow from it. So you're getting a nice bit of intake from the bottom there. Yes. That's wonderful. Okay, so all the fans are spinning, guys. Um, <laughs> now then, what we will do now, guys, is We'll grab the power supply for the LEDs, plug this guy in, which will also go here. As you can see, stuff is filling up, you know, this rack is pretty populated now. Populated at the back anyway, the front is still looking pretty bleak. But that will all change soon. Let's pull through, let's pull through our power connector. And I think all of what we've got to do with the LED side of things, guys, is going to be done at the front. So let's go and deal with all of that, and uh, yeah, maybe maybe I should at least try and do a little bit of decent cable routing. LED installed, super basic. Got the power supply that we just fed from the back, going into the infrared RGB controller. That'll be mounted to the side using Velcro. Um, we've got some little cable tie anchors here that'll help us guide whichever is the most appropriate length cable down the side of the rack. I'm thinking something like this. We're going to go with white because it's closer to the rack colour than black. Uh, I do have black cables as well somewhere for these little 4-pin LED connectors, but white is fine. Plus it's going to be hidden behind here anyway. So we'll run cable down there, run cable underneath the bottom strip here, if there's a gap. Uh, just about. And then... Uh, one sat in the bottom and one sat in the top. We're going to quickly bung this together and then we'll have lighting in the rack. So we are hooked up. I'll be able to give you a, a better shot later on once I've got everything back. Um, but we've got a little controller mounted up there with Velcro. Power supply cable isn't the neatest, but we will sort that in the future. Once again, once I know what's going here, once I know what's going on, we'll sort all that. 
So we've got that, and then we've got the top strip. As you can see, the, the little infrared bit is just tucked here. I'm free to move it wherever I want. So if I want a really good signal, I can put it right up against the glass if I want it sat there, or if I don't mind, I can just have it back there. Probably what I'm gonna do is leave this on the dimmest setting and leave it on all the time. Um, then we've got the actual cable feeding the strips. You can see is running along there running along there we've got it hooked up there going through there and then it's neatly you can't even see it you can see a couple of the anchors and that's it it's neatly going along the side and then back down out the bottom you can just see a loop of it there and then into the bottom strip and there's still enough freedom on the cable to move the bottom strip around we'll get the perfect glow you can see it shining a lot on the UPS at the moment, but it all depends on what angle you're at. You know, we will jiggle things around and get it the perfect kind of density of light. So, um, that's it, we're done. I'm gonna put the back panel back on, we're gonna push the rack back into place, and then we can take a look at things. So I waited for a hot day to record the outro clip to this video because we are gonna look at the temperatures of this rack. Now it's a really good sign folks, it's a good sign that I have the cabinet door closed. So there you have it, as you can see, it's closed. The fan that has been permanently switched on in this room since I moved to this room and fired up the rack, that fan is off. The blind has been open all day, so the sunlight has been beaming down. It's like half open, as you can see, I never really open it more than that. Um, the sun's been beaming down onto onto the roof all day it's 2 p.m in the afternoon and the window is closed so there's no draft in here at all no air circulation and the current temperature outside is 21 degrees celsius so it is a hot day that is a pretty typical kind of toasty day for us you know if we get a 21 degrees celsius day here in this part of the country um, we are all saying, yeah, it's a hot day, you know. You get hotter days, obviously, um, but you also get cooler summer days. So this is borderline on a worst-case scenario because I'm going to crack open the window any minute. I've purposefully left it closed for the experiment here. The window helps because as soon as you open it, it's such a big opening, you get this big kind of flow of air. So even though you get this warmness coming down in the atmosphere, the air is still circulating, so it's quite nice. Now we're gonna take a look at the Mac Mini first. So, let's take a look at the Mini. Now, I'm looking at the Mini first because it's definitely the most underwhelming result. Um, she's a bit toasty. So, CPU A heatsink, 75 degrees C. Then we've got uh, CPU A proximity, 71. Temperature diode on CPU is 85 degrees, fluctuating between 85 and 86 there. This is with medium folding. Um, this system may throttle slightly if we cranked up the CPU workload even more, okay? Um, it's, it's getting up there in terms of heat. It's not touching that 100 degrees yet, obviously. Um, quite a few degrees from it, in fact, but still a little toasty. Hard drive bay one, 56 degrees. Northbridge, 73. Um, this is where we're a little toastier than I would like. So uh, Northbridge position one, 64 degrees C. I don't really keep an eye on these kind of temperatures, but uh, the drives here, we've got two drives in here, 48 degrees C and 57 degrees C. So those temperatures are definitely toasty for hard drives, guys. Definitely, definitely. And what I've done here with the Mac Mini is a little bit of a blunder, really. I have, not only have I sandwiched the Mac Mini in between Monster Raid and Scaro. Monster Raid isn't even running, remember? So that will generate heat. So I've sandwiched it between the two hottest systems. I've put a boiling hot power supply next to it on the shelf and it doesn't have any direct cooling. It's, it's enclosed in a shelf. It doesn't have any airflow from, from the bottom or the top because those units, both Scaro and Monster Raid, are much deeper than the Mac Mini. There's vents under the shelf. That's one good thing. There's vents under the shelf and there is that little gap that we spoke about previously in the video of a few millimeters. So there is some airflow under the machine and the machine isn't tight up against Scaro. As you guys know, there's a bit of a gap there but it definitely is drawing the short straw in terms of cooling. So, Mac Mini's run hot anyway, relatively hot. Um, but if they're out 
in the open on a desk, they do run a lot cooler than this. So if I open the door right now, I, in fact, no, I won't because that's going to affect the temperature of Scar. I'll open the door in a minute to talk more about that. Let's go and look at the happier story for a moment. Um, the hard drive temperatures on Scaro while in use. We're looking at 38, 41, 40, and 38. These tend to fluctuate anywhere between 35, and the highest I've seen them is sort of 43. So I am chuffed to bits with that, guys. That is within safe margins for these drives. Now, granted, the WD Red drives aren't very warm drives. They don't typically run hot. They're not renowned for running hot. Um, if I was to put drives that were known hotter drives in here, we may have an issue. And that is sort of the theme with what I've managed to achieve with the cooling here. It's okay. It's allowed me to close the door, but it isn't perfect. It's not completely adequate. And I think one of the main reasons for that, there's, there's lots of different reasons, obviously. Um, but we are putting just PC fans into a case this size. And we're essentially trying to cool three PCs worth of equipment with one intake, one exhaust, and just one little fan floating around in the middle to try and help things out, which may or may not be helping, you know. Um, so it's not a great deal of cooling. I would rather this cabinet had four 120mm cutouts on the top here. You could put four fans on the top as exhausts. Some intakes on the side would be absolutely incredible. And then, because you could run six or eight fans, you could temperature control them and then you'd get a quieter rack as well. So you'd be shifting more air, you'd have cooler temperatures, and you'd have a quieter rack. But I'm going to play it by ear. I'm going to see what we're going to do. The last thing I want to be doing is drilling holes in this lovely rack cabinet, because the, the thing is with this guy, it's made for um, networking equipment and comms equipment and things of that nature. It's not made for servers. You know that because it's not deep enough to hold servers, right? You know, these these shallow depth servers, you know, this rack station here and this monster raid system, they're kind of anomalies, you know, they, they break the rules in a way. Servers are deep and servers simply do not fit in this case. You know, it was a job to find a UPS that fit in this case. It was a job to find a rack station to fit in here. You know, everything you've got to check depth because it really is, in the grand scheme of things, a very shallow rack. So you know from the get-go it's not designed to have server gear in it. The most kind of processing intensive gear it's probably designed to have in it is kind of like a nice switch or a nice router, um, a firewall, you know, maybe a, a low powered kind of um, uh, PC that is doing something like PF Sense or whatever, you know, stuff that really isn't going to kick out a lot of heat. But when you put one, two, three, four, five, six, seven hard drives currently running now in that little stack there and uh, four more hard drives to add in the future when I finally replace the drives in that system. It is it is toasty, as well as, of course, the CPUs running in those things. Um, so, I'm pleased with the cooling upgrade, guys. I am pleased. It's a little on the loud side, and it isn't performing amazingly, but it's doing a stellar job, because if I was to close this door before, uh, before having cooling in the rack, the Synology would go into... Um, a temperature panic. So here we'd have um, la, 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 general where it says here system temperature status normal. Um, that would not be the case if I was to close that door and turn that cooling off. Uh, I'd always have to have the door open like this and I'd have the fan in the room pointing around the rack here. Now when I put my hand in the rack, the general atmosphere in here, the general air, it feels fairly cool which is nice. You know, the, the fans are doing a good enough job to cool the, the loose air in the rack. There's just not quite enough pressure there to start cooling down the, the individual components significantly. Um, but, again, overall really pleased. So that is it for the update on the cooling of the rack. As one quick comment as well before I do the closing remarks on this video, I do feel like I'm going to get comments from people asking um, why have I spaced out the equipment in this way? Why have I not separated things more? And the main answer to that is, even though I've sort of covered it all in this video, but as, as a kind of like a closing statement about it, I am reserving space for future equipment. 
So even though I don't have anything planned to go down here at the moment, this is a 3U gap where I could put something really, really substantial. That can go there. That is my bonus space. All of this space up here, there is a plan to utilize it. And hopefully that plan will come together and that will then be the beginnings of the next evolution of the networking series, which will be a new series altogether. So what I wanted to do at the moment is just get this equipment that I had, the main bulk of my equipment, in this Type 4U space here in the middle. And yes, it may not be the best for cooling at the moment, but it means that I don't have to shift everything around like crazy when I want to add the equipment in the future. It's the additional equipment, sorry. So there we have it for the answer to that question, which I think is going to be a sort of popular one that people ask in the comments. So just anticipating that one. <laughs> so there we have it, guys. I am absolutely sweltering. I cannot wait to get this window open. And you guys have been watching this for way over two hours. So I'm going to make the outro brief. I don't want to drag things out. Thank you so much for the support. Since 2016, we've been doing the home networking series. It's spread across seven parts. No idea what the total runtime is. I, I assume it's getting close up to sort of like nearly 10 hours for all, all the parts combined, I guess. Um, I've had some of the most fun I've ever had making videos doing this series. And it's crazy to think we've spent so much video time doing something so basic and simple. Just introducing a small wired home network with a couple of accessories on the side. Um, but I've really enjoyed taking you along every step of the way. Um, while doing this project. I've not left anything out. You guys have seen absolutely every reincarnation of the setup and every tweak and modification we've made to everything along the way. Um, so you guys probably know my network better than I do. Um, so thank you so much for the support and, and your continued support by making it to the end of this video is just bonkers to me. The fact that you guys can sit here and listen to me for all this time. So thank you so much guys for watching. I really do appreciate it. And I hope that I can get the ball rolling on this new network series sometime soon. Um, still haven't ironed out all the full details. As you guys know at the beginning of this video, I was talking about um, a future series. I began recording this video over a month ago. So the planning, pro the planning procedure for this next project that's coming up, that's network related, it's taking a lot of planning and a lot of back and forth. Um, so hopefully that will all work out and hopefully it doesn't fall into a big pit of flames and never happen. But I am doing everything I can to make it happen and I cannot wait to deliver that to you guys because it will be like this series um, but just on steroids really. So um, yeah, cannot wait for that folks. Thank you once again and as always I will catch you guys in the next video.
Eli, what do you think of that? Um, cool. It's cool. It's cool, is it? Yeah. Why is it cool? Because it's got very, very flashy lights on pretty, and I like them. You like them, do you? Yeah. Do you know what that is? Yeah. What is it? Computer. <laughs> yeah, it is.